Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Laura Bornfriend, Director of Early and Elementary Education Policy here at New America. Thank you for joining us today for this slightly different conversation than we were planning, but we're happy to have all of you online and have a few people, a few uh, presenters and our second panel in, in the room. Um, we're here to have conversations today about some of the most challenging and entangled issues facing the early childhood education field. Preparation and education, compensation and status, workforce diversity and inclusivity. As we envision early childhood education's future, and as we envision how best to value and advance the ECE workforce, we must resolve these entangled issues, which we identified as the thorny knot in the series that led to this event. Stacy will tell you more about that and how it came to be in a few minutes. And as we do have these conversations and resolve these issues, I've concluded that equity and the educators themselves must be front and center. And so must quality early education opportunities for our youngest children. Everyone in this room and listening online knows that early childhood educators play a critical role in learning and development of children. These educators also provide an invaluable service to families and their communities. Consequently, their work is complex and requires specialized knowledge and skills. Plus, as I think we all agree, they deserve to be compensated at least on par with their peers in elementary education. Advancing the early childhood education field is not simple though, and it's not limited to requiring degrees and increasing pay. Across those in the field, there are multiple ideas for how to move forward and many aspirations for early childhood educators future. As yet, we do not have a clear path forward. But efforts are underway to change this. As part of the initiative stakeholder group, I want to take this opportunity to congratulate our friends from NEYC and the Power to Profession Task Force, some of whom I think are online with us today. Many of you may be aware that at an event yesterday, the task force released its unifying framework for the early childhood education field after three years of consensus building work and stakeholder engagement. If you have not yet seen that framework, I encourage you to go to NEYC's website. For our conversations today, we want to go beyond descriptions of the thorny knot. As one panelist said while we were planning for this event, we have spent a great deal of time admiring the problem. So today, we want to look forward, we want to talk about real solutions, and we want to identify the next most important step for valuing and advancing early childhood educators. There are important, important voices missing from today's conversation. I want to acknowledge and own that up front. I am proud to say the same is not true for the compendium that you can find online. Um, we have some copies in the room. There are some physical copies of these um, which, which we'll be dis distributing. Um, you know, we, we hope to be able to do that and you can find it online. But multiple questions that the panels will discuss later today will be about who is missing and how authentically and meaningfully to include them. Due to increasing travel restrictions put into place by entities across the country, we've had to transform this event into this online conversation, but there are still multiple ways for you to engage. You can ask questions through the Zoom webinar platform. Feel free to add them as you have them and then our moderator will raise your questions with panelists at the end of each discussion. We'll be having two panel discussions today. And for those of you who would also like to participate in the conversation via Twitter, please use the hashtag false choices right there in front of you on, on the screen and we invite you to um, engage on Twitter. If you're interested in other topics related to early education, please check out our Early and Elementary Ed Policy homepage at newamerica.org slash early ed. For all our blog posts, policy papers, and, and other content, we've had a busy first quarter. So in my unbiased opinion, there's lots of great <laughs> things to find there. Um, some of you may not be as familiar with New America. Our organization is dedicated to renewing the promise of America and strives to explain and uncover the implications, both the challenges and opportunities inherent in a time of dramatic technological and social change. 
In our education policy program, we focus on equity for students who are underserved by their schools and society at large, while also taking a broad view, examining learning environments and public education systems of all kinds, starting with those serving our littlest ones and continuing up through adulthood. In our early elementary and uh, early and elementary education work, we work to ensure that all children have access to a system of high quality early learning experiences birth through third grade that prepare them to thrive in school and in life. And now I have the pleasure of introducing our moderator for the first panel and my partner on the Moving Beyond False Choices um, for Early Childhood Educators Compendium, Stacy G. Goffin, Principal at Goffin Strategy Group. Stacy, please take it from here. Hi, thank you, Laura. Hi, everyone. Thanks so very much for everyone who's here, both in person and online, and also for everyone's adaptability. I really want to make sure before beginning that we all acknowledge Laura as well as the team at New America for the amazing effort that they have done in the last like 24, 48 hours um, to transition from what was structured as a very different kind of event to the one that we're going to get to enjoy today. So again, I really want to say thank you. And then I'd like to could if I would, or if I could, I would make eye contact with all the team members who are here who've really made a tremendous difference. So we want to say thank you for that. So I'm just going to give a setup for the panel discussion, the first panel discussion. And I'm going to begin by talking. Well, I hope I am. Hold on one second. Oh, goody. Our first te <laughs> technology issue. Hold on one second, everyone. Try again. Maybe it's a little too far away. Um, in which case, we'll figure it out. Okay. Okay. Yeah. First slide, please. Yeah, I wondered about that too, actually. All right. So I'm just going to start talking, um, and then hopefully the slides are going to follow. So my, the first thing I want to make sure for those who may not be familiar is uh, providing a bit of an overview of this 18 month uh, series. And for what it's worth, I think when we started engaging with this, we thought it would just be maybe six months. <laughs> um, and then it expanded, thank you very much, um, into an overview of the first um, 18 months. So we're one slide, there you go. Um, and as many of you are aware, but perhaps not all, what we attempted to do was to really um, engage with the complexities of what, as Laura indicated, we've called the thorny knot for early childhood educators. And what I would note for us, please, is that it says for early childhood educators, not early childhood education. And I think that's often a switch um, that we don't um, tune into. Um, and the thorny knot is comprised of three threads, education and preparation, compensation and status, and then the field's diversity and inclusivity which in, for the purposes of this series was um, defined as uh, birth to um, five. So the series goals, next slide please, um, was to really try to, again to bring new voices to bear that would help us to disentangle um, the thorny knot and its three strands. And we tried to begin to do that work was by uh, soliciting diverse perspectives to first prompt um, introspection, secondly, to inspire new thinking, and thirdly, to try to explore new possibilities for rethinking the relationship among the three strands. So the next, click. Um, the stimulus for this uh, was actually Albert Watts um, post uh, that was titled Increasing Early Childhood Teachers Education, Compensation and Diversity. And Albert, remind me that came out like three or f three years ago, maybe? maybe. Yeah, <laughs> uh, 2017. And um, I think it's worth noting here is that um, Albert, who was a neighbor at the time before I left DC to move to uh, Colorado, um, after reading his post, I went to ask him if he would be okay if I would choose to provide an independent individual response. Um, and he said, sure, that would be fine. And then as I started giving it more thought though, I realized like, wait a minute, 
rather than just offering one opinion, there was this incredible opportunity in terms of the issues that his post uh, presented to actually explore this more deeply and to do so as a field, which is something I feel very strongly about is that we need to be engaging far more of us in these conversations and we need to be engaging across the diversity and range of roles that exist at all levels and uh, programmatic areas of the field. And so Albert generously said, sure, go for it. And pretty importantly, in this instance, so did Laura and New America. And so that's what then led to the ability for us to do this. So why the compendium? And the next slide, please. Why the compendium is because, and then you can put up the first, first kind of click, because it's annotated. So the, there were 32 posts, and those posts were all equally substantive um, and thought provoking. And importantly, we believe they helped actually refashion a debate that for far too long has been polarizing the early childhood education field. And the energy was clearly present for extending the conversation. So as we began planning for the compendium, we went through all of the posts and then identified five themes from the series. So the next slide, please. Um, and the five themes were, first one was degrees in education, the next was higher education, third was race, class, and gender, the fourth was early childhood educators, and the fifth was in family child care. And that should not be seen as suggesting that any one of those themes was more important than the other. We've simply presented to them to you in the same sequence as they are evident um, and discussed in the compendium itself. So next slide. So what we then did was to identify new authors who would bring different perspectives to each of those theme topics. And importantly, were individuals who were, again, as uh, kind of diverse as possible in terms of bringing different voices um, to the conversation. And each of these questions were what we were considered next questions that needed to be presented to us as a result of what we um, what was revealed for us, if you will, in terms of the posts that were present in each of those topical areas. So the first one, and again, in order of presentation in the compendium, um, is by Rebecca Cantor and Christy Cowers. Their topic is degree or was degrees and education. And the forward thinking question for them was, do degrees and education matter? for early childhood educators, why or why not? And again, each of these authors, as I'm going through them, wrote introductions to the theme topic. And so when you have a chance to look at the compendium and how it's organized, you see these new introductions as well as then the original posts that informed these new authors um, in relationship to their question they were asked. The second question, which was addressed by Marjorie Kostolnik, was um, the theme topic of higher education. And her question it was, why does higher education need to be, what, sorry, let me try that again. What does higher education need to do differently to regain its stature as a gateway to the ECE profession? The third, next slide, thank you, um, was addressed by Linda Hassan Anderson and her theme topic was race, class, and gender. And her question, what is the role of race, class, and gender in resolving ECE's thorny knot? The fourth was um, addressed by Sophia Jackson. Topic was family child care. And her, the question was, where does family child care fit in the early childhood education system? The fifth question, by, uh, which was addressed by Ariel Ford, was specific to the topic of early childhood educators. And her question is, why do early childhood educators' voices matter in conversations about the field's thorny knot? And then to kind of bookend, if you will, we have two essays, an opening and closing essay. The first one was written by Albert Watt, and it explores the question of, what does equity and progress look like for children and their early childhood educators? And then the closing essay, if you will, written by Laura, uh, it tackles the question of what's needed for early childhood education to take a big step forward. So I want you to just be aware, please, that all of these new 
um, the intros and the essays, so all these new contributions, all are framed around questions to which we don't yet have answers and for ones that we're, we're arguing it's time to begin to articulate what those answers might be. So let me now segue to today's event. So the first discussion um, that I'll be moderating continues on the pathway, if you will, of asking provocative questions. And we have questions, new questions, that we'll be asked of each of the authors. And to the extent possible, we're encouraging panelists to not only, not only answer the questions that are asked of them, but to also to engage um, with each other in terms of Q&A from the audience. And Q&A from the audience in this instance refers not only to those of you who are in the room, but also to those of you who are online. And so again, to repeat the instructions that Laura offered earlier, you can do that at any time, and you have two options. You can do it through the Zoom chat, or you can tweet at New America, dot, right, New America Ed um, at the hashtag false choices. So either of those, and then those questions will be passed to me to um, share with everybody and to ask you know, for answers again from our panelists. And then we will go into a second panel discussion and that's going to be um, moderated by Amanda Garcia and that, uh, excuse me, Amaya, sorry, sorry, Amaya. And I should know that so well because my granddaughter's name is Maya, so all I have to do is add a little <laughs> to say Amaya, um, by Amaya Garcia. And that includes two essay authors um, and two, our delight, two practitioners who very last moment agreed to alter their schedule so that they could also be here um, this morning. So we're just delighted by that. Um, and they will be introduced by Amaya when we get to that point of the conversation. So we are now ready to enter into the first panel. And let me introduce who our panelists are. And I think you have a next slide, which also will show everybody's names. Uh, yeah. Okay. Next slide, please. Okay. All right. So, so people can begin to hear voices. Um, so panel members, perhaps when I say your names, you might just kind of say a hi to everybody and um, wave to those of us um, who aren't in there in the room with you. So, um, and this is just listing them now by alphabetical order. So Linda Hassan Anderson. Welcome from the Pacific Northwest. Yes. <laughs> um, and Linda is the president and C CEO of NIA and Associates, Inc., and the interim chief program officer for the Center for Equity and Inclusion um, in Portland, Oregon. And again, I thank all of y'all for joining us in um, this unique way this morning. Um, secondly, though, I get to actually just turn to my left and look to Ariel Ford. Good morning. Oh, excuse me. I've got allergy voice. Good morning. <laughs> um, and Ariel is the director of um, early learning for the city of Chattanooga. Then we have Sophia Jackson. Sophia? Hello, everyone. <laughs> um, and Sophia is the early childhood systems director at the North Carolina Partnership for Children. And I should note for all of y'all, when you go again to, as we keep doing this show and tell, um, of the compendium, then you'll find bi everyone's bios inside here. So we're not giving you those introductions because we know you'll find this information in here. Um, Rebecca Canner, Rebecca. Good morning. Um, and Rebecca is Dean of the School of Education and Human Development at the University of Colorado, Denver. And then we have Christy Cowers. Good morning. And Christy is director of the National P3 Center at the University of Colorado, Denver. And right, Christy, you're also um, an associate clinical um, professor at the university as well. That's correct. And then last but definitely not least, we have Marjorie Gastalnik. Hello from the middle. Yeah. <laughs> um, and Marjorie is a professor at the University of Nebraska, Lincoln. So here we go, guys. Um, and as I start with asking these questions, sometimes I will be asking them of specific panel members. Other times I will be asking them of everyone individually on the panel because we want to make sure we get the benefit of all of their thinking. I want to acknowledge up front, though, that uh, facilitating and, man and time management are a lot more difficult in this context than if we were all together. And so inviting um, the panelists to be attentive to their time, but also um, 
to seek apologies in advance if perchance I'm thinking like, oh my gosh, this is not gonna go on, on and on and inadvertently cut you off uh, sooner than I should. So apologies in that regard. Okay, so first question is for you, Linda. And everyone, um, the panelists had these questions in advance, so they had an opportunity to uh, prepare. They're not being caught off guard. Um, the series title, Linda, as you well know, is Moving Beyond False Choices for Early Childhood Educators versus Early Childhood Education. And numerous authors, including those of you on the panel, have highlighted the need to differently engage early childhood educators. How might you have approached your introduction differently if you had been asked to also try and channel practitioners' voices? So I think that's a really important question. Uh, I definitely reflected on the voices of practitioners because they're often referenced, but not centered or amplified. And I think I wanna reframe my response just a little differently. I would actually be unwilling to channel their voices as I strongly believe that they have agency to present their own points of view when included. Um, if I had approached the invitation differently, I would have specifically thought more deeply about inclusion. I would have certainly considered whether it would work to invite a practitioner to really be the primary author or to the very least co-author the section with me. Um, I'd also be really interested in making certain that the section was translated into multiple languages and that we thought about multiple formats for delivery. That way we would um, have provided broader access to the materials, particularly to those that are gonna be most impacted by the conversation. So I'd say in hindsight, I considered the power dynamics of the invitation as I received it when I accepted it from New America and really didn't deeply consider any alternatives to simply saying, yes, I'd be willing to be an author. Thanks. Is there anyone else on the panel who would like to add to uh, Linda's response? Then, then I'm going to switch. Yeah. Okay, Rebecca, thank you. I've asked people to help me to see, literally see, when there's a question coming up because the screen is at such a distance that I don't see it as well. So, Rebecca, chime in. Okay. Right. So um, we just wanted to chime in that um, to some extent, some of us did incorporate providers' views. In our blog, we, um, we have the great fortune of having colleagues that have done extensive survey work with the early care and education workforce here in the state of Colorado. And we actually uh, tapped into the survey findings around what the, early, the ECE workforce here in Colorado wants and would hope for in terms of uh, degrees in education. And we did include the, uh, those perspectives in our blog. So I think there's a range of probably how we consider engaging voices and to what extent. Um, and I think in policy conversations, we probably need to be savvy about uh, the methods and timing for engaging voices. Thanks, Christy. Anyone else? Okay, so Ariel, um, it's been suggested that individuals in positions such as yours may inadvertently be preventing early childhood educators from being le leaders on behalf of their own work. What do you think needs to change if realigning the field's present power structure is a priority as suggested by blog series authors as well as many of the introductions? So uh, thank you, Stacey. I, I was a little sad that you shared that we got these questions up front because I was going to Spain kind of, oh, um, that's kind of a big, I mean, it's a big question to ask and I think a big question to wrestle with, but as I have been wrestling with it, um, three things came about for me. And the first uh, is that we as kind of intermediary leaders or um, positional people with positional authority have a lot of responsibility to do uh, some internal digging and to think about, you know, when I hear people in positions like mine and, and when I catch myself um, saying phrases that maybe I hope are not in my heart, but I say them out loud. And so there is some truth to that about, 
about the field, you know, and I'm using kind of maybe some air quotes around that. Um, so how are we as these positional people with positional authority uncovering our internalized oppressions? So how are we understanding how misogyny and internalized white supremacy and ableism and, and on and on, how are those, how is that Gordian knot um, creating a, a set of conditions that we are imposing on and how we set ourselves up separate from the field and how we assume that we have the right to speak on behalf of the field. And so I think there's a piece that we have to do internally and with one another where when, when we are in the room and confronted with someone who says, well, you know, the field, they're just not educated enough, you know, and, and, and we hear that. I mean, I, and then the field knows that. So nobody is immune from knowing when they are being oppressed or being thought lower than, and that's an unacceptable thing for us to continue. So that's thing one, I think, is that we have to do that hard internal, and it's, it's messy, and it's unglamorous, and it's ugly, and I don't think we can ignore it, or I think we've ignored it too long, maybe. And then I think the second is um, following maybe in line with the themes of the of the compendium is that we need to take that same honest and rigorous look at our systems and really kind of take a cold light of morning view and think about how are the systems that we've set up from licensing to QIS to higher ed to, you know, um, to uh, how we onboard staff and teacher or educators how are all of their systems designed to make invisible the voice of educators? So they are designed to make invisible. I mean, they are separate from, it is done to. And so that is something that I think we also need to do internally with ourselves. Um, it is not educators' fault that that happened. So I think it's a little unwise for us to ask them to engage in fixing something we've broken, um, at least initially. And then the third thing I think is then we have to have engage in the work of fixing it um, and we have to prepare for responsiveness. So how many times have we held focus groups or had surveys and we get responses and we don't do what teachers tell us to do every day, right? Um, so, so those are the kind of three things that I think sequentially maybe even need to happen. Thanks. Okay, and we promise you these would be provocative, remember, and invite us to think <laughs> forward. So appreciate both of the responses we've gotten thus far. So my next question, which is kind of a two-parter, I'm going to be asking of each panelist. And so Marjorie, if I may, I'm going to um, look to you first, and that may be more, uh, look maybe more of a, what's the word I'm looking for, kind of an abstraction or symbolic there. But starting with you, um, what of each other's ideas did you find most intriguing or thought-provoking and related to that after reading each other's introductions what questions do you have of each other so i'll repeat that since we had a um, unexpected interruption there what of each other's ideas did you find most intriguing or thought-provoking and after reading each other's introductions what question might you have um, of one of your fellow panelists okay well Everybody had thought provoking things. So I actually have a list here for everyone. I won't, <laughs> I won't subject every person. But I'd like to start actually with Linda and the whole notion of looking inward. And the, her, one of her uh, premises is that we need to shift from blaming to much more internal re uh, reflection and taking responsibility. And when you think about it, that relates to everything so far that we've talked about, organizational structure, higher education, community leadership, uh, funding sources, regulatory groups. How do we begin that shift really beyond just talking? How do we actually have people shift to a much more internal introspection, some sense of we have a hand in the problem as opposed to we got to fix those people because boy, they're a mess. So I would ask Linda, how do we begin that? Wow. 
No, that's Sorry. a great <laughs> question. Um, I could come out of retirement wealthy if I had a clear answer to that. But certainly uh, for me, the starting point, and I, I think your question points in the right direction, that individuals have to actually be willing to take a step back, and I, I definitely want to acknowledge that I saw that in everyone's writing, that, that introspection, that being willing to say, maybe we have some hand in the solution as opposed to looking externally, I think is a great starting point. Um, I think each one of us has a life uh, journey that's very, very different. And so to assume that all of us are starting from the same point is probably um, a false assumption as well. Uh, certainly as a person of color, a lot of my reflections are um, very, very different than many of the people that hold power and leadership in the country. And so I think that being willing to take that hard um, internal look, and then secondly, to create some shared agreements, some shared language about how are we talking about our desire to go forward. Um, because I think to this point, a lot of the language has been um, externally focused. You know, how do we help them figure out what the next steps are? Um, I think that's as far as I could go in terms of my own personal reflection on that, that particular issue. But I'm pretty excited that more and more people are in the conversation of who am I in the matter of the solution as opposed to why can't other people fix this problem? Um, thanks. So Marjorie, would you just pick the one, one of the others uh, that you'd like to lift up for us? Sure. Um, in, uh, Sophia, in your essay, um, access is a key idea that you lift up. And you talk about things like childcare deserts in communities. You talk about IBA groups and F family um, environments uh, as worthy of attention, support, and investment. And my question to you is, if access is an issue, how do we open the door? How do we make that access possible, that first step possible? Sophia, hold yeah, on. Have Sophia, hold on one half a sec, please. Um, Marjorie, tell us for, so all of us know what IBA refers to, please. Okay. <laughs> this was in your essay. Do you want to talk about the vocabulary just a little bit, Sophia? I mean, I can, but I think you can too. Um, I'm happy to build on what you um, share, but I'd like you to take a stab at it because I'm in just interested to hear your perspective on it. Well, I saw that family um, coordinated or community child care, family child care is FCC and IBA, independent business associations and independent groups. Okay. Thanks for that. Uh, making sure, talking about shared language earlier, that we had that shared language for you, Sophia. Go for it. Okay. So, um, hi, everyone again, and thank you, Marjorie, for the question. Um, the ideas of access that I put forth in my article really challenges us to think about the access for um, children and family and access to opportunities for rich learning environments. A lot of the conversation that we're talking about is raising the quality, and I put forth um, ideas for how we can improve the access to opportunities, um, learning environments that will ultimately give us more um, context, if you will, for the quality conversation. So when I, uh, some of the ideas that I think would specifically help increase access is central to my, my article and introduction, and that is lifting up, prioritizing, centering, and, and increasing our collective value around childcare, uh, family childcare as an option. So one really quick thing that I think that we could do to um, work with family child care providers, increase the, the respect that is attached to the field, um, and increase opportunities 
is to really think about how we support the business development of those that are interested in get, getting into the field. So um, the business roundtables or the family child care network, those are methods or strategies that will help um, create strong learning environments for the adults that we need um, and th that need support in stepping into a very unique uh, field and industry. Thanks. So Christy, I'm going to now move to you and ask the same question. Do you want me to repeat it? No, and are you going to have Rebecca and me answer independently or do you want us to do this together? Um, you may... Uh, Since we wrote the same article, that's why I'm asking. Right. Well, um, I still see you as uh, having um, distinctive voices, and so the intent was for y'all to do it individually, but if you prefer to do it together, that's okay. No, it's, no that's fine. Um, so, so some of my reflections um, that weave throughout all of the essays are around these notions of inclusivity and whose voice matters, some of the questions that Ariel just responded to, and I have a little bit of a different perspective in that I feel like we need to be thinking about the ECE workforce more broadly, not just the teachers, not just the educators who are inside classrooms, but we do have a large cadre of policy leaders, Ariel mentions these in her essay, intermediaries who probably need their own training, leadership attention, um, policy advocacy skills, policy development skills that can be enacted in inclusive, equity-focused ways. Um, and so I think my sort of question to, to all of our co-authors would be to sort of reflect on the extent to which we elevate only the early childhood teacher's voice in these conversations versus also finding ways to elevate the policy savvy and the equity-based policy savvy of some of these intermediaries in the workforce as well. Um, and is there anyone you'd like to direct a question to in that regard or are, is that just kind of a minute? <laughs> I know, sorry, time would not allow for everybody. So is there someone in particular that you would like to direct that question to? Uh, I, can, I can direct it to Ariel to start, since as I said in her essay, she actually talks about the intermediaries perhaps being part of the problem. Thank you uh, for giving me a more chance to talk some more. So I think, um, <laughs> you know, uh, I, think, I think it's potentially both and. I, I, my concern when we start to add people to the list of needs is that the void, the, the, the centering of educators is diluted. Um, and we have done that for my entire career. Um, and so I, I actually would take a hard stand and say, no, that is not our first stab at this, that we elevate educators, that we provide spaces where they give us instruction as policymakers and influencers. And then we, we do what they tell us to do. And if at that point there is an understanding that we as those intermediaries need more education or supports, then, then we go from there. But as an initial stance, I say no, that we focus on educators, that we center them. And Rebecca? I'd like to build on that. I'm sorry, is that Rebecca? Is that your voice? No, that, is, that was Sophia. Oh, okay. All right, yeah. Sophia. And then Rebecca, you're next. Okay. I just want to um, agree with um, Ariel's position. We started off the conversation talking about centering voice, and I often find that the conversation um, can be um, limited or stopped at bringing voices in or um, incorporating perspectives. One of the opportunities I think is equally important is um, fostering agency. And I think that's what Ariel is talking about. Not only how do we increase the voice, but also expand um, early childhood educators, um, family child care providers, child care center directors. How do we increase their agency to step into the policy conversation? 
<laughs> and for those who could not see Ariel nodding her head in the <laughs> affirmative, <laughs> I will just uh, bring that forward. Um, Steve, Rebecca, this is Christy, can I quickly just tie those two thoughts together? Go for it. So I don't disagree with either of those positions, but I, um, I want to keep pushing, though, that I feel like when we talk about increasing voice and agency and degrees and education, we tend to focus on the skills, behavior, knowledge, competencies that are effective inside classrooms. I want to argue that if we're going to increase agency, we also have to be thinking about the skills, behavior, knowledge, competencies that do make people effective policy advocates, policy developers, policy influencers. And that might be, those might be skill sets that are not chosen by everyone in the early childhood workforce, but we do need to be finding those people to raise up and bring deeper into the field. So I, I do think it's a both and. I think that's what Ariel said. Thanks. And so I have to say, for those of you who know me, do you know how hard it is for me not to join this conversation? <laughs> <laughs> okay, Rebecca. Yeah, so thank you, Stacy. I want to return to first to Linda's comment about looking inward and reflecting as individuals and suggest that we also need to look inward and reflect as organizations and as sectors. I don't know what else to call the higher ed world. We're not, a, we're not an organization, but we're a sector of the bigger landscape. And also reflect on our responsibility and our um, histories, because we really, the, the kind, for example, there's a, we talk a great deal about fragmentation and, though, and that fragmentation is not the responsibility of individuals. It's really, we've all contributed as, part, as individuals within organizations and within sectors. Um, we have this layering that we do in the field. Those of us who've been in the field for a long time can attest to the many, many layers of work that keep piling one on top of the other. And we, with a really um, a kind of tendency to not give anything up as we layer something new. So the fragmentation we have and the layers we have are really our responsibility and, and trying to figure out how we deconstruct that is gonna be organizational at the organization level as well and at the sector level as well. Um, so we are individuals and we're individuals inside contexts that are re responsible and need to spend a little time reflecting as well um, should I pause there in case Linda wants to respond to that? Thanks. I, I was actually raising my hand in the, in the chat room. And I just had um, a note making sure okay. I saw it. <laughs> yeah. So thank you, because I think that this is definitely a both and conversation. Like there is systems level work that we absolutely have to take on. And while I do think that we've got many different groups with different sets of skills and agendas, that a novel way to consider approaching untying this thorny knot might be a cohort that has policymakers, that has practitioners, that has multiple voices together, um, really deconstructing, like, how do we get here? And then uh, conceptualizing what might be the way forward. And I think part of what happens when you use that kind of approach is that you also have to have some affinity spaces, right? So that you, you give the practitioners an opportunity to come together, um, that you give the policy people a chance to come together separately, if you will, but then that you bring everyone together inside of a common goal. So I do think it's a both and. I think that there's work that individual groups need to do. But I think at the end of the day, we're talking about transformation of systems, which means that there's going to need to be some overlap at some point in time. Okay. And, uh, and Ariel wants to chime in too. I, I don't disagree with that. What I would urge us, a caution I would urge us to consider is that in those, in those shared spaces, there, there are power differentials and that educators how are educators being encouraged to see themselves as powerful in those spaces when we have never 
allowed them to have power in those spaces before. So that's just an adaptive piece that we would have to navigate through and create some structures for. Um, that would be my only addition to that thought. Right. Yeah. Yeah. My second thought was, was going to, um, be a reflection on what Sophia said uh, in her piece, which is just to um, note for a moment the irony that access, which has been at the center of our conversation about childcare for many, many decades, is also at the center of the problem for um, educators in terms of making progress toward a degree. So my lens is going to be both in the essay and in this conversation is, is really gonna be about higher education. And the incredible um, moment I think we're in as an industry, higher ed as an industry, to, to shift what access looks like for early childhood educators and many communities of, of potential students and learners. We're in a, a, we're in a moment of change in higher ed that is making my head spin, and I, I bet many people in positions like mine um, have are, are spinning as well because things are changing so rapidly. But there's great opportunity in the change that's that's happening to really shift what access looks like. And, and we're here because we care about early childhood educators. Access for early childhood educators to, to at the end of a long day given the salary and compensation constraints and everything else is something we need to think about very seriously. And I think as higher educators, we have an opportunity to change the design of what our programs look like around issues of access. Marjorie, I think you have a hand up. I do for just a moment. I was thinking about this whole conversation and you know, who is the target audience? Who, who are we working with? And while I agree that it's very important that we keep our eye on the educator and the wraparound support that they need within the field, I would go back to Sophia's notion that part of access is developing allies, people who don't realize they can become allies people who don't recognize that, for instance, family child care providers have a small business and that they need the help of the business community. Um, things like that. So on the one hand, I think we have to keep our eye on the field, but we also have to help the field figure out some ways, and that includes us, to increase the allies that surround that field and see that investing in the field is to their own self-interest. So I realize I might be taking this down a different, little different path, but I think that all of this is part of that thorny knot because it is complex. So Sophia, I'm gonna use that as an opportunity to ask you um, the question of, what did you find in others' ideas that were particularly intriguing and thought-provoking? I meet myself. You know, I think um, before addressing a specific um, part of the compendium that was intriguing, I am um, intrigued overall by the intersectionality of the conversation. Um, the idea that we're looking at education, preparation, compensation, and diversity, race, class, and gender. I believe that all of our essays really highlight just how complex this, this is. And I love this question, the statement from Ariel earlier, how did we get here? Um, and how do we sort of um, untie the thorny knot? So um, I think the, the tone of this entire conversation is intriguing to me. Um, specifically from the compendium, uh, Marjorie, your piece um, left me thinking a lot about um, truly the intersectionality that we need to exist in higher ed in order to address some of the ideas that I put forth in, in my piece. 
So you title your article, What Does Higher Ed Need to Do to Regain Its Stature as a Gateway to the ECE Profession? I really liked that higher ed was sort of put forth as a key player or a major actor in helping to untangle this knot. Um, higher ed is often in um, a field that can define certain reputation of fields. And, and if we engage higher ed in untangling this knot, not, from my perspective, I believe we could begin um, positioning family child care as a um, enticing field of learning and track of and, and degree attainment that can be found within higher ed. So there's a lot of power that exists within higher ed. And I found um, just that question and thinking about um, my piece, I found that intriguing. My question is, you state, um, well, before the question, you state colleges of education and human development, education, human services already exist nationwide. That is absolutely right. I'll put a rhetorical question out there. What other fields of professions need to be included in that? And, and to your point, where do we get additional allies? So nod to you. Thank you for pointing that out. My question um, is, um, you asked a provocative question here. How can higher ed address ECE more coherently across professional divides within the, within, within the academy? My question is, what do we know about what causes those divides, and where have you seen um, successful work across professional divides within higher ed? Just a small question. <laughs> that's what we're here for small question okay. well to be honest i think it's about territory divides come about because of territory access to resources power status within the institution and how we allocate status in the institution we allocate status through funding we allocate status through awards, through university-wide initiatives. There's lots of ways that higher ed uh, gets status. But we're seeing a major shift in higher ed. We're moving away from the single uh, investigator model. We're moving away from totally independent uh, programs. And we're starting to see that there is benefit in working together, both in terms of our productivity, if we counted in research dollars, if we counted in attracting students, if we counted in being able to have an impact in the community, the more interdisciplinary we are, the more effective we are. And the whole notion of a collective approach is becoming much more valued in places like the National Science Foundation, NIH, et cetera. So one, the bubbling, the percolating that needs to happen for greater interdisciplinary uh, work is there. But the big thing we have to do, and I'll talk about this a little bit later also uh, in the conversation, is we have to stop saying fit my model. We have to say, instead of saying, oh, you're welcome to come in and be like me, we need to be saying in higher ed, what is the vision? What is it that we're trying to build? What is it we're trying to achieve? And how can we do it together? Not, you give up your identity, you come on over, we'll open the door a little for you. No, it has to be a restructuring. I'm gonna segue now to Ariel. I was just doing a time check, guys. That's what was going on. So Ariel? Yes. Yep, your turn. Uh, so some of the ideas that really sparked my interest, Linda, you were inspiring to me with ideas of, you know, follow the money, which I could kind of hear you just saying with like this intensity. Um, and then the question of, and I think this is one that we need to wrestle with as a, as a field and, and probably don't have the time today, but is, is any solution acceptable? I think that's a really deeply important question for us to ask. Um, uh, I also loved thinking about educators wanting degrees and having data to show that because there is kind of a false narrative around educators wanting, you know, a behavior workshop. 
Uh, and that is not my lived experience is that educators are like, yes, please, I do want a degree. It has to meet my needs. It has to be accessible. Um, but please don't make me take another literacy class, you know. Um, so I'm being a little flip. But the question I really wanted to ask is to Sophia, and it's, I, I love that the, I am a product of family child care. And so I, my question is, what do you think that we as a field more broadly, and you spoke to this around higher ed, but what do we as a field more broadly need to do to support family child care as a part of the field? Um, I think the onus is on us. Yes, um, I say establish the value, a, a collective sense of valuing family child care as critical. Um, you know, I come from Illinois, um, I'm, I'm in North Carolina now, um, but in Illinois, I have been a part of so many conversations that um, equally position family child care as a solution in our field with center base, with school base. And, uh, but when I look across the nation um, and within certain states, the, the conversation or the value placed on family child care, um, it, I would argue just isn't there. Um, I would argue we need to significantly reestablish that um, family child care as a critical part of our sector. I think that once we, um, and, and let me acknowledge there, uh, one could argue, well, value is placed because we have QRIS systems for family child care. And, and what, what I'd like to push back on that and say, yes, we have these, these infrastructures, um, but what do we really believe about the importance of family child care? Do we believe that home-based learning environments are a critical option for um, our youngest learners? So, um, and, and I believe once, once we start there, once we really start um, looking at the decline in numbers and, and really um, seeing it as a crisis, I think that will then a range of solutions and strategies will will come from that. Thank you. And Linda, I'm going to let you close out um, this particular question. And guys, I am starting now to watch time because we want to make sure we have enough time for the Q&A. And I remind folks who are online that you can be sending those questions at any time. And you have two options for doing that. You can do it through the chat box or you can do it through Twitter. Wow. Okay, one question. Um, I think I'm going to address it to Marjorie. Um, and I, I love all that you've said about higher ed and what you envision um, and the potential for kind of reinvention at this point in time. My curiosity is about um, how higher ed could be in a position to scale to actually impact the sizable and urgent need that we have in the field. Well, um, that's a good question. I think part of it is recognizing that we could be working across disciplinary boundaries and in doing so that increases our capacity to work with the workforce. So instead of each college of education and human science having to have its own business people, we could work across with colleges of business. We could work with colleges that look at small business and look at the labor force in that way. We are notorious for teaching our own child development courses, for teaching our own, um, all, all of those kinds of things where it would be possible for us to collaborate with other areas of psychology, for instance, on campus. But it isn't just, again, I'll just take whatever you've got to deliver. It is that disciplines in higher ed need to be talking to each other about how they really create um, rich ecosystems that students can participate in to have a really robust understanding of the fields that they are approaching. I'm not trying to make that sound too esoteric, but that's really how I think it would work, is we would look beyond ourselves, look beyond petitioning the provost to give us 10 new positions. Now, I have to be careful, I was a former dean, I was one of those people asking for those positions. 
and instead looking at my colleagues, other colleges, other programs, and saying, how could we work on this together? Becca, would you like to build on that in any way or offer an, um, a different kind of response? Yeah, Marjorie, I, I absolutely agree with everything that you just said and all the things that you've said in, this, in the context of this compendium. But I'm also gonna push us in higher ed to think about giving up some of our long held positions about um, oh, transferability of credit, for example, from associate degree programs into bachelor's programs or from one higher ed institution to the other and suggest that we're, we really need to be as absolutely flexible and self-sacrificing as institutions as we can be in order to let people build and make pro build a degree, make as opposed to earning a degree, to make progress in their degree pathway. I, I recently s sat with a young woman who had 60 credits from five institutions, and she and we were trying to figure out how she could come into ours and make progress toward a bachelor's. Um, you know, in the old days, decades ago, we would have accepted some portion of what she had and asked her to retake things so that her degree came from us. Positions like that. And today I wanna say, I said to this person, we're not gonna ask you to retake anything. We're gonna find, we're gonna align what you've taken inside of our program and help you continue to make progress. I, I think those are the kinds of um, changes I think we have to be ready to make as well. And I would agree. <clears throat> I knew you would. <laughs> <laughs> so moving now to a next question, which is also gonna be invited um, of the group as a whole. Um, so y'all have put forth a lot of ideas, not only in your intros, but I think um, in this conversation we're having in the present about what needs to change if we're gonna disentangle um, the thorny knot for early childhood educators. So what do you see though as core elements of the field that need to be retained or said differently, what do we need to avoid losing? And typically when this question gets asked, people will very quickly move to the question of diversity and you know, our passions around equity. So I'm gonna ask y'all to make that an assumption <laughs> and think about what might be one or two others that we want to avoid losing, that's one way of saying it, or make sure that we hold tightly onto and not let go. And I think now I'll just kind of keep reversing the order here and um, we'll look to you, Christy, to kick us off. Great. Um, so I think the one piece that we don't want to lose as a field is the mixed delivery system. Mm -hmm. um, and one of my concerns with um, with sort of always talking about compensation that's equitable to public school teachers. While I like the premise of that, we have to make sure that that doesn't steer us toward a public school only delivered system of early care and education. And so I think we need to strive to find ways to make sure that we preserve family choice, we preserve community-based uh, centers and family child care homes um, in, in all of this effort. All right, so let's look to um, you, Linda. Um, I'd like to see us hold on to our commitment to meeting the unique and individual needs of practitioners. We are really clear um, from a, a perspective of child development that meeting individual unique needs of children matter. And then I think we lose sight of that when we start thinking about meeting the needs of practitioners. So I wanna make certain that that would be one of those non-negotiables that we view the individual practitioner and their unique gifts as well as their unique needs as a focal point for scaffolding their growth and their learning. So before um, moving on to one of the next of y'all and thanks Linda for that, there's a question that's directed to you um, I think Rebecca, um, but Marjorie might also include you as well. And so now I'm reading the question and thanks to whomever is online who just submitted this. I'd like to say how much I agree about um, 
Rebecca, I think it was Rebecca, but maybe Marjorie as well, just now in terms of talking about how higher ed should refrain from asking others to fit into their mold and rather to be willing to embrace the vision <coughs> and to fit the needs of the diverse field. And the question is, how do we do this? So Rebecca, we'll start with you and then um, Marjorie, in case I, I misheard voices, um, switch to you. And then I'll return back to the original question. <coughs> And that's allergies. <laughs> <laughs> I promise, I promise. <laughs> yeah, so um, we're piloting lots of, uh, we're piloting many versions of our, our pathway, our program here at CU Denver to see how, how far we can go to meet the diverse needs in the field. <coughs> Example, one of the more interesting things that we're doing um, that I'm excited about is what, is what we're calling a place-based model. So we're working with um, three large uh, community-based care and education systems in the area to put together a cohort that will meet at the end of the day on site in one of those three, three places where we will have child care for the participants, where we will um, literally bring our program to the cohort so that they don't have to travel downtown to our campus. One of the things that in a recent survey was named as a barrier. We are, <clears throat> excuse me, we're going to treat our program all of our courses have been aligned with the early childhood competencies of the state of Colorado. So we're going to work from a competency point of view, assessing the members of the cohort and working really in a very customized way with each member, um, not staying within the confines of a traditional course, but working on a set of competencies that we agree and negotiate with the members of the cohort to work on all of the assignments and everything we do will be about their practice in their classrooms. So the idea is in place based is not only to bring the program to their place of work, but to customize the content of the program to their, to their work very literally. So if we're learning about assessment, we're going to assess the children in their classrooms together. Um, and then we'll back it out monthly to talk about assessment more broadly and to read about assessment and so forth. So the idea is to simultaneously reflect on and build your practice while you are earning credits toward your bachelor's. The idea is to take down the barriers that have been named, access, childcare, cost, confidence as a student in a recent workforce study in uh, Colorado, and try to um, overcome those barriers by bringing, <clears throat> excuse me, this place-based idea to a cohort. Um, that, that's one of several different models that we're piloting, um, and, and each model is, is designed to really think about the needs that we've heard from the field in, in different ways. So we, I, we, do, we fundamentally do not believe that an off-the-rack, one-size-fits-all program is viable. Uh, to Marjorie's image, you know, the come, come, we have this nice program for you, is, is not going to create more access and um, create more support. So we're trying, in that particular model, the place-based model, the idea is to build practice and earn degrees simultaneously. In other models, the goals are, so, are, are somewhat different, but across, across the pilots, we're trying to find the design um, that will be most successful. So Rebecca, I know this is a uh, question that really taps into some passion. <laughs> I'm obligated time-wise, though, to yes, no, no, go ahead, go right ahead. Move on. And um, Marjorie, are you okay if I return to the original question? Sure. Okay. So this is to remind us all that it's about what do we need to um, want to retain and to avoid losing. And um, I think. Rebecca, maybe now's a good time, though, to let you answer that question very quickly about what is it that you think is really important for us to uh, retain, to slash to avoid losing? Um, As we think about all these changes that are being proposed. And again, I do have to ask us all to be uh, attentive to the brevity and conciseness of our answers. 
Sure. Um, well, I, 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 uh, I'm trying to think if I have anything novel to add. I, I certainly agree with the mixed delivery system. I think it's critical. Um, I think um, this is a slightly different take on, I'm going to answer it in a slightly different way. I, I think that we have invested as a field in a great deal of coaching and professional learning. And I think that my, my position is that we need to find ways to connect the, the coaching and professional learning to credit toward a degree, not to necessarily give up on it. Lifelong, career-long learning is important in all fields, but to create that, it's another way that higher ed is going to have to bend and flex, but also the professional development world and the coaching world will have to bend and flex to make that connection um, so I, I guess I'm, I'm qualifying the, hang, let's not lose the professional learning commitments that we've always had and the coaching commitments that we've developed, but rather connect it more meaningfully to credit so that it all leads somewhere. Um, thanks. So I'm um, now, Ariel, your response? Uh, so I, I thought about this question really differently than my colleagues, and um, <clears throat> I, I was thinking about what made what would what made a difference in my trajectory, especially when I was an educator. And so, given the assumption that the diversity is important, I might throw a little bit of a monkey wrench in that because uh, a thing that was deeply and profoundly important to me is that this is a field that is led by diverse women. And um, while I desire greatly men to take up the mantle of care and to begin to engage in that work, I will not sacrifice women as leaders in the field uh, until that has, until men um, become caregivers and educators themselves. So that's a completely different way of answering that question, Stacey. Um, and the, that's You're welcome. A, thank uh, you. Yes, yeah, that's exactly the kind of uh, diversity of viewpoints that we yeah. um, are hopefully inviting today and throughout the compendium. And so, um, Sophia, if you could offer us your thought and feel free to pass. This is, these are not forced um, answers if you, you know, would just like to move on. And then just Marjorie, so you know, you're going to be the one who closes out this question for us. And we have gobs of questions piling up. And to let you know, it's interesting. They're almost all revolving around higher ed and degrees. Um, yeah, so quickly, my two answers were taken. I agree that um, we need to maintain the mixed delivery system and specifically the connection between the professional development sectors and the higher ed sectors. So I would just add um, that as we try to untangle this thorny knot, let's hold on to our creativity. Um, there's been a lot of creative solutions that address all of our issues um, or ideas that we put forth. And I think if we um, hold on to that and live into it more, then we will um, continue to find the solutions to the thorny knot. Thank you, that's optimism. Um, well, for me, um, what I would say is I don't want us to lose our partnership with families. Early childhood has a long history of partnering with families, not necessarily blaming families seeing families as partners in their child's learning and development. And I hope that no matter where we go as a field, that we keep that as a central tenant of our practice. Thank you. Um, all right, so guys, the last question for y'all is a whole group um, so that we have sufficient time to respond to the um, questions that are coming um, from the online in particular is, and each of you again to please answer it, is what do you see as the most important next step for moving beyond false choices for early childhood educators. And um, looking at my list of y'all and trying to move this all around, I um, think I'll look to you, Ariel, to kick off as number one. Sure. So uh, Stacy warned me that I needed to be succinct. <laughs> and so I will say that this is, I am going to put forward a personal commitment. And so I, I have gotten really comfortable asking, you know, is this a diverse panel when I'm being asked to be a part of a panel? Is this, a, you know, are many voices included? But I have not been good at asking if uh, the field is going to be represented and if educators are on the panel. And so my commitment now is not to be on panels or to speak about the field without the presence of the field. 
um, and you know what, I'm going to actually avoid asking her to define what she means by field. <laughs> so, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, Linda? Um, so I think the next important step, and maybe I'm just kind of shaping it, um, is looking at how do we ensure at every step of the way equitable access, whether it's to conversations, um, whether it's to higher education, like that equitable access, access maybe being the operant word, um, be something that we always use as a filter. Sophia? Yes. I think the next um, most important step that we should do is really focused around um, what I mentioned earlier, like um, enhancing the agency of those that are center in this conversation. Um, so specifically, I think that we should um, identify the family child care providers who are leaders, who are models, who have demonstrated the excellence that we want in our field and um, convene and center their voices in continuing the conversation about how to expand what they have um, created. Uh, Marjorie. Um, focus on competencies versus locale as the key to the education of the workforce and to stop treating the status quo as the starting point for creating the new constructs we need. I'm an old Piagetian and I'd like more accommodation, changing the structures versus assimilation, which is just stretch them a little. Um, Rebecca. Um, yeah, I need to go back to, I think it was mentioned in the opening, to the idea of partnerships, who we, who we bring together to, um, to make those changes. And those partnerships include um, state government with, and all of the various pieces of state government with higher education, the professional learning, professional development and coaching community with higher education with state government, and of course, and all of our thoughts about who should, how we include the primary stakeholders uh, across the field in those partnerships will be very important. But I think it's really time to address the fragmentation and to connect the dots. And uh, that's not going to happen if we're not sitting at the same table. Thank you. And um, Christy. Uh, Rebecca and I did not coordinate this, even though we're sitting next to each other. Um, my uh, commitment and next step is to keep these issues front and center in the policy conversations. Uh, again, I hear the need to elevate voice, but I have to say, while we're continuing to increase voices, policymakers are marching ahead with or without us. And so I think as many of us need to show up and be responsible, responsive participants in the policy process now. Thank you all. Um, I'm gonna look to, the, to those of us who are present momentarily to ask if any of y'all have um, questions, but first I'm gonna go to one of the questions that have been received online and again, um, encourage those of you who are to feel free to submit your questions either via Twitter or the chat room option that you have. So this question, again, as I said, a lar almost all of them revolve in some way around degrees in higher ed, which is kind of interesting. So how do you support higher ed? And whoever would like to answer, then you're just going to have to speak up, those of you, again, on the panel. How do you support higher ed to be the catalyst of agency for educators? And what competencies and program requirements does higher ed currently have that are not supporting the agency of educators, which are, I think that, so I'll read that again. This is was a multi-pronged question here. So one, how do you support higher ed to be the catalyst of agency for educators? I'll just start with that. And then introduce yourself by name, please. First name when you, um, as you choose to answer, so we can all recognize your voices. This is Christy. Hmm. Uh, come work for Rebecca Cantor. 
Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I mean, I say that somewhat um, uh, uh, in a cheeky manner, but I do think that we need to seek out the innovative voices in higher ed to paint all of higher ed as a monolithic entity that's not willing to change is really unfair. There are places doing really innovative, creative things all over this country. Find them, talk to them, partner with them, and then come work for Rebecca. Yeah. Well, and, and I have the incredible um, opportunity to work in an institution like CU Denver, where we have, where we have a culture of, of innovation and thinking about diversity over almost 60% of our undergraduate student body um, is diverse and in, in some it either, are either first gen or students of color or in some way uh, members of marginalized communities. So our whole campus is geared toward thinking about um, how we give agency to students and how we enhance and increase the opportunities for students to be successful. So it's really, it, it, it's layers. Um, it's, it's easy to work at an institution that lets me be innovative and, and think about how we flex our programs in order to enhance student success. Anyone uh, else want to chime into part one of that question? Okay, Marjorie. Well, could you repeat part one of the question? Sure, absolutely. And I don't think I read it very well the first time, that's for sure. So how do you support higher ed? And I think that's kind of the royal we. Um, how do we support higher ed to be the catalyst of agency for educators? I think there's two ways. And I would agree with the speaker, uh, I guess it was Christy who said, Lots of really good things are happening in higher ed. Higher ed is not, uh, you know, a place that hasn't changed at all. It has changed. But I think there's two ways to get agency. There are many more. One is how you hire people. And if we can hire across uh, disciplinary boundaries, that's something we're doing at the University of Nebraska came from a college with seven departments, everything from nutrition and textiles to ed psych and elementary education. Every one of those departments has hired people in early childhood so that they can work uh, more collaboratively. I think a second thing that higher ed can do is to work with those intermediary decision makers Department of Education, Department of Social Services, and Department of Labor. Those departments are likely to listen to people in higher ed. And so we can go to them and talk to them about some new ways of doing things for the future. And perhaps creating more of an ecosystem within our states in which those departments more regularly communicate across those lines. So I think those are two ways of promoting agency of uh, early childhood workforce. Thanks. And so the second part of the question, which I'm um, probably editing as I go here, but is there any singular um, competency or program requirement that any of y'all feel is actually blocking the agency of educators or potentially supporting the agency. Oh, Ariel, go for it. Uh, so one of, one of the things that I, working with in-service educators would love to see more of is that um, early education is contextualized in with a policy lens, with a kind of a cultural lens. And so rather than, you know, solely discrete skills or, you know, methods, classes and development, that there is also a, a broader contextual, contextualization. And for me, that would be um, super helpful when they leave the college classroom and enter the little people classroom and understanding their work and their role. So the next question, um, which continues in the a kind of a similar vein in terms of looking at higher ed and degrees, but I think speaks to something that I know um, I get to hear a lot about is how do we continue to increase quality 
and early educators' credentials without pushing, um, pushing out long-term educators. And again, if you'll introduce yourself before answering the question, that'll help us all. So this is Rebecca Cantor, and um, I'm glad you raised that question. I saw it in the Q&A uh, space, and it's a very important one. It is another way that higher ed, at least in the circles that I'm in, is thinking about changing. So notions like credit for prior learning, credit by evaluation, credit by assessment, um, borrowing from um, other industries that are looking at apprenticeship models. All of, all of those kinds of changes have potential, I think, for addressing the part of the community that um, is being raised here, people who are long-term, long-time uh, educators in the field and have a great deal to bring, um, a great deal to bring in to higher ed as a basis for credit. That's that's where I would go. Anyone else want to build or and or add to that? Okay, Sophia, I think these um, next two questions that I'm going to try to merge are going are primarily directed to you, which is what steps or suggestions do you have to make policy changes? on the state county level um, to implement the push for family child care providers um, to begin enrolling and participating in higher ed, particularly given um, the compensation issue or their compensation issue. Um, yes, so at the core of, of that very large question, which I would, you know, think about often and would love <laughs> to have a longer conversation about is how um, wages, subsidy, and access to higher ed kind of all work together. And I think, um, you know, when, when we think about the wages piece of it, um, it's a problem for our entire sector. It's not one that's specific to family child care. Um, I, I've seen solutions that have included family child care in the conversation. But I think first, if, if we're going to really support um, that part of our sector, of our field, to have access to higher ed, I go back to the creative solutions that make it um, possible for family child care to access um, innovative solutions. In my article, I talk about um, my colleagues and friends at the McCormick Center for Early Childhood Leadership who have worked with the higher, with National Lewis University to create highly subsidized learning opportunities that result in college course credit. So when those creative solutions um, are, are brought to bear, it is, it's one way of managing the, the cost of higher ed that thus impacts um, the wages that family child care providers take home. I'll just close by saying we, we all need to advocate for greater, um, more substantive uh, subsidy rates and subsidy access. I think that can also be part of the conversation around wages and compensation. So I'm gonna now look to those individuals in the room while I can see over here, people who are recording questions <laughs> are um, deciphering. Is there anyone in the room who has a question that you would like to ask a, a panelist? Sorry, am I missing a hand apparently? Albert's pointing for me. Yes, please. Hi, um, thank you for this rich conversation. I was really interested in um, how you think about early educators in relation to, um, and sort of thinking about early educators as like zero to five versus those sort of employed in like a public school system. We sort of talked about differences in compensation, benefits, et cetera. Um, and whether you see there being some competition, I guess, in terms of trying to get um, policymakers attention and resources and um, whether there's the, possibility of sort of broadening and strengthening the coalition by sort of bringing these groups of educators together or whether they are sort of inherently kind of competing and so there's not a way to do that. Be curious to get your take on that. 
Christy, did you hear all that? I did. Um, I think this one was uh, customized for you. <laughs> um, I mean, I think, I mean, uh, I'm trying to figure out how controversial I want to be. I mean, I think in I'll some... go for controversial, Christy. <laughs> we hired you for that. <laughs> I, I think in some respects, we've been our own worst enemy in, um, in some of this work. I think back to, you know, the early 90s when some of the early childhood system building work was first sort of booming um, under the likes of Sharon Lynn Kagan and Louise Stoney and Ann Mitchell. Um, and we had governors Roy Romer and Jim Hunt really thinking about these issues and it was a birth to five field then. And it was, we did not have as much of the splintered um, public school versus child care versus family child care. It felt a lot more systemic. Mm -hmm. um, I, 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 I can't think quickly enough on my feet to diagnose all of the reasons we're in this situation we are in right now. But I do feel like we, in an attempt to raise quality, we have created bureaucracies, whether it be QRIS systems or new competencies and credentialing and certificate systems that benefit one of those delivery systems over another that are taking an inordinate amount of resources, both human and fiscal, to keep those bureaucracies and new, new things churning along. Um, so whoever asked that question, I couldn't, I couldn't see. Um, I mean, I think this is one of the really big systems-based issues that we need to be grappling with in this field, is how can we talk about us as a unified birth to five and, and, um, and, and try to move away from <laughs> creating strands of work that, as I said, only benefit or are targeted towards one strand or another. Okay, thanks. Is there anyone else who wants to chime in? As I keep, now I'm starting to get little notes to say we have these many minutes left, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's one question that asks, have any of you contacted, excuse me, conducted research or tested the hypothesis that obtaining um, ECE degrees actually affects or impacts on classroom practice. And I think to the extent that I know y'all part, I should add to that question, or do you know a particular study that you would like for whoever submitted this question to be aware of? In other words, if it's not your research, is there one that's informing your efforts um, that we should all be aware of? Okay. Can research or test, have either researched or tested the hypothesis that obtaining early childhood education degrees impact classroom practice. And I'm interpreting that literally, it doesn't say a degree, it says ECE degrees. Anyone on the panel or frankly anyone in the room who might be able to answer that question? Go ahead. Um, so what I really would like to see is a comparative study of the programs they are doing like this place-based coaching uh, opposed to the other programs. Yeah, I'm gonna interrupt I, if I may. Do you, have, do you know a study? Cause you're gonna get no, to be no, on a panel, no. you're gonna be on a panel momentarily. Yeah. So, so hold on to that. Is there anyone who actually knows of a study or a conducted one? Yeah. The Virginia Early Child Foundation conducted a study to uh, uh, learn a little bit more about mixed delivery and uh, they compare the outcomes of children that attended mixed delivery with the outcomes that, of children that attended uh, children that were in school-based programs. And they found that uh, there's no significant differences uh, in terms of outcomes from children that are attending these community-based centers that have high quality care and education in them regardless of the fact that they have less uh, staff members yeah. that have degrees. Gotcha. I don't, could everyone hear th that answer? Okay, I didn't know, if, again, because of the mic and the location of the mic. Anyone else to that before I go to, um, hold on, I'm reading actually, guys. <laughs> okay, so this is a, 
Oh. Sorry to jump in. So I, I wrote you a note, but you were holding on to it and not looking at it. <laughs> okay, well, that's because I was reading what was in front of me. This is, this is Albert. Uh, yeah. Just want to, uh, whoever asked that question, point you to, I know it's a really long report, but the Transforming the Workforce report from 2015 does review the research, and the m findings are decidedly mixed, but there are some in, you know, on both ends of that. Concern. Yeah, thanks, Albert, and thanks for inserting yourself. So for the, I think this is going to be the last question, I'm looking again around the time. It depends on how long the answers go. <laughs> <laughs> um, and again, is there anyone else in the room who has a question to ask? Because right now the online folks have definitely been privileged. <laughs> okay. Um, and sorry that I didn't have the chance to ask all the questions that have um, come to me. So this last, what may be the last question, um, the majority of the family child care providers that this individual's agency works with are monolingual Spanish or Cantonese, and many of them have very little formal education coming in. And often um, their own education stopped at middle school in their home countries, and some are almost illiterate. What are your thoughts on supporting these providers and increasing access? And again, anyone who on the panel who has thoughts on this, but please introduce yourself by first name um, before you begin. And you can tell you have a challenging okay. question because people are thinking. Okay, I, I'll, I'll go. Um, and, and in the interest, oh, hi, yes, yeah, sorry, this is Sophia. And I would say simply um, really, what Marjorie referenced earlier. If we're creating open doors um, for higher ed and learning, the question isn't how do you come in and be a part of what's already here, but how do we meet you where you are in order to be successful to a higher purpose in, in our field? Um, so, you know, that can, that comes with a lot of specific strategies for how we actually recruit, engage, um, and sustain um, relationships and enrollment with students that don't have the, the background or experience that um, typically is required for, high, for higher ed. Um, okay. Yeah, thanks. so I, I'll, stop, I'll stop there. <laughs> okay, thanks, Sophia. Anyone else on the panel? So I'm going to bring um, the first panel to a close. And again, apologies that not all the questions submitted got, um, got asked. But to each of you now on the panel, and again, with all kinds of gratitude for your participation and thoughtful <laughs> um, comments today, um, and then asking for brief uh, responses to boot, if it would have been possible to allot 200 more words for each of your introductions, and believe y'all who are listening in or here, um, we had lots of opportunities to say, no, this is too long because of the word limit. Um, so if it would have been possible to add 200 more words for each of your, and when I say introductions, because they're introducing these theme sections, or if you were writing it now, what new thinking would, do you wish you had included or now with hindsight would like to have added? And I'll pause to let you get your thoughts together before starting with you, Marjorie. Well, in the introduction that I wrote, the whole idea was talking about being more holistic. So our vision is holistic, but our strategies are fragmented. And alignment begins with uh, agreeing on a vision. And often because of accreditation standards, because of licensing requirements, et cetera, and those are all good things, they are the current drivers. And I think our vision of the field and what we really expect of the field should be the driver. Christy? And here, if you and uh, Rebecca want to um, quickly caucus 
that would certainly be understandable unless you all have a different point of view. We have different, we have different points of view. They're complementary, but they're different. Good. So mine, Go mine would be to, um, and this is a, a somewhat of a nice extension from what Marjorie just said. If I'd had 200 more words, I would have wanted to point out the intersection of higher ed reforms with the competing state policy infrastructure and how if we didn't have competing teacher licensure and early childhood competency frameworks and that it would make the early childhood fields work easier. So I would have wanted 200 more words to really talk about the policy infrastructure and the need to align there. Thanks. Rebecca, so glad we got different views here that we get to hear. <laughs> so if I had 200 words, I would have talked about design thinking as a field that has a great deal and a framework to, that has a great deal to offer higher education because it's all about being human centered, about keeping the focus on the experience of the humans in the context. They, it's about addressing wicked problems and certainly the problems we're talking about are pretty wicked. Um, and it's not about research and evaluate, trying something and jumping immediately to research and evaluation, which we've done very, uh, we've created many cycles of that in our field, but rather trying something, observing and studying what's happening and refining and relaunching that, that model or that, that strategy, and then again observing, documenting, and re revising and relaunching. Giving, giving our ideas some time to emerge and to evolve, which we tend not to do. We tend to throw something out there, see if it sticks. If it does, we research and evaluate. If we don't get the right findings, we, we start all over. So I think design thinking as a way of approaching how we change fundamentally what we offer would be useful. Thanks. Um, Sophia. So yes. Sophia and I had lots of conversations about 200 more words, didn't we? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to start my answer with that, and you won't be surprised with this. If I had 200 more words, I would advance, um, I would try to advance two ideas that um, were only sort of referenced in my piece. Um, and that is one really um, highlighting more and um, sharing more around why family childcare is a unique and important solution for our infant toddler crisis and how repositioning family childcare um, is a very tangible racial equity strategy. I'm glad you got the opportunity you've been looking for. <laughs> Ariel, uh, so if I had 200, I would want 2,000 more words. And, um, <laughs> but I think what I would ask is that we begin to learn what educators see as their outcomes. I think we um, you know, touched on that in some of the questions from online, but what, what do educators feel they can say their work's goals are? We have given them kindergarten readiness. I don't know that they would agree. Um, and Linda, if a, Pre prelude to my thanking everybody for their amazing contributions. Wow, um, so 200 words. Um, I definitely would want to include some very specific words from the specific voice of practitioners. Um, I would also want to look at including what my processes look like to advance both individual and system level reflection on the, the notion of building competencies around equity. Um, and I would want to really give more thought to what that systems level thinking could look like um, to kind of undergird the aspirational desire that we have for greater equity and greater equitable outcomes for the educators. Um, so to each of you, I wish you were here so I could be applauding you. Um, we really uh, tremendously appreciate how you have adapted and accommodated this change. And I'm speaking for myself, I'm delighted about how this all has turned out because it was a little like dicey about, are we gonna be able to make this work or not? 
Um, so, and without you, we certainly would not have, as well as those of you who are present. And so at this point though, then I am about to, I am going to segue to Amaya, <laughs> and you're gonna watch some of us who are out the front kind of uh, move ourselves so that we can make room for the next panel. Hi all, we'll be muted temporarily as we move around. It'll be probably three minutes, thank you. Hi, um, I'm Amaya Garcia and I'm going to be leading the second panel and we are going to focus on responding and reflecting on the panel that came before us and then also answering some more targeted questions based on the essays that Laura and Albert wrote and on um, the perspectives and experiences of the practitioners who have joined us, Esteban and Isabel. Um, so let me go ahead and introduce everyone on the panel. So. We have Albert Watt, who is a Senior Policy Director at the Alliance for Early Success. We have Maria Isabel Bayivian, who's Director of the ACCA Child Development Center in Annandale, Virginia. We have Esteban Morales, who is the Education Director at Centronia here in Washington, D.C. And then Laura Bornfriend, again, who is the Director of the Early and Elementary Education Team here at New America. Um, so to start us off, just asking a question to all the panelists thinking about the last panel and what from the last panel did you find most compelling or challenged your own thinking about these issues? Well, uh, I guess it's very exciting to see the time that early childhood is living right now all over the world. Uh, this question about if education matters, it really strikes me. I think it does matter my personal point of view is how that education is structured and at what level, because I think we need to we need to strengthen all the steps of the ladder. This is not just to send the people to do bachelor degrees or associate degrees. 
This is also to have people to have a stronger CDA program because some of them, that's the step of the ladder they're gonna get. And, and we need to really solidify to answer this question of paradigm shift from early care to early learning. Well, I agree with, uh, with him in that it, it's exciting times for early childhood, but it's also very challenging times. We either get it right or we don't. It, we're capturing the attention of policymakers. We're capturing funding. Now the question is, how can we ensure that all this attention is driven in a way that it becomes an effective uh, agency of change for improving uh, the lives of young children in our communities. Uh, it's exciting to see that there is finally acknowledgement of the importance of the diverse workforce. Uh, I, in my community, have been working with uh, people that come from many places in a program where we serve about 250 children at a time. Um, and sometimes even a larger group, we have uh, staff members that speak 21 languages. So there are challenges in bringing the profession forward. There are challenges in uh, meeting that common denominator of expertise in the field. And it's great to see so many people coming together to try to tackle those challenges in meaningful, effective ways. So I'm excited to be here today. Um, so this is Albert. Um, so there are a couple of things that struck me um, from a you know uh, policy perspective, uh, which is the, the sort of seat that I have in this field. Um, one is the conversation that I think Christie's comments started about the respective roles of policy professionals like myself, advocates, policymakers, um, you know, policy researchers, et cetera, as opposed to the educators themselves in terms of advancing the profession and to what extent can can these two, gen, you know, these these two communities kind of play complementary roles? To what extent do we need to sort of get into each other's lane a bit? Um, and how do we navigate? Uh, as I think Ariel said, the power, power dynamics when that happens. And so I, I'll I'll say a few more words about that later. The other is um, I what I heard, and I don't know if anybody put it quite like this, but what I heard was that. A lot of us, in order to do this, to move forward and advance the profession, a lot of us are going to have to let go of some of our power uh, and and work maybe against a bit of our self-interest and 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 give a little bit of a turf. So I heard that in the higher ed conversation. I heard that again with the policy professionals um, and what how we work, um, and then also in just the kind of the professional development systems that we the, and some I think somebody used the word bureaucracies that we've set up in terms of coaching system, the QRIS and all the re resources that go into those and to what extent, you know, do we, we need to reallocate some of our attention resources from those things to maybe things that um, really advance the profession more directly. And I'll just add that I, I think one of the, the most um, important points that, that I heard was around the important role of family child care in both um, addressing the, um, you know, crisis in infant and toddler care and how family child care can play an important role. Um, I think also an important role in rural communities. And so exploring that um, more and how we can support, better support and build uh, family child care providers, I think um, uh, was, and what um, kind of policies uh, need to be in place to better build and support family child care, I think is, is something um, that should should continue to, to be elevated. Um, also, I think just the discussion um, in the first panel around higher ed um, was also, uh, you know, something that's particularly important for our work and I was happy to see and also intrigued more by the by the questions that that might have been posed. So, um, uh, by the, the audience around higher ed. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that um, in my uh, other remarks as well. So Albert, I'd like to start by asking you a question and, and everyone else on the panel can also feel free to respond. But in your essay, your opening essay, you make an important admission about 
that you didn't always consider or take into account the perspective of early educators in these conversations. Um, so first, kind of curious about why you had a shift in thinking and now see like the value in it. And then um, to quote Ariel Ford's essay, what should be done differently to authentically engage educators in these conversations? So, so I wouldn't say exactly that I never took the, <laughs> no. the first minute of early I hope I, did, I, I hadn't done that. But, um, but it, it is true that I, I feel like I've, I've made a shift in, over the past year. And I want to start my answer to that question by quoting a couple of excerpts from, from the essays, one from Linda and the other from Ariel. So in Linda's, Linda's essay, she said, those in power who in the early care education field are largely individuals representing the dominant culture must own their part in excluding and minimizing the full participation of those closest to children's lives. And then from Ariel's essay, she wrote, the reliance on intermediary leadership is an, an intentionally reinforcing a paternalistic system of authority in which those farthest away from the work hold the majority of power. I, those resonate with me because I see myself in the dominant culture and I see myself in the intermediary leadership. Um, and before I talk about like what, um, so, so I'm sorry. So, so, so I think policy professionals like me need to be asking ourselves, it my, is my voice what's needed right now? Who's, whose voices are missing? And those are the questions that I have in my head as I move forward. Before I get to the sort of concrete about what can be done about it, the solutions, um, I want to also sort of respond to kind of the conversation I mentioned earlier that Christy started about the respective roles of policy professionals and educators. I think there will always be a role for policy people, whether it's advocates or policymakers or people like me sort of doing sort of state policy work. And, and federal policy work to who, are, who don't have day-to-day -day contact with educators and kids and programs. Um, and frankly, I don't want to be too self-serving, but I think the field needs people like me <laughs> who have, whose job it is to read, all, read and write the policy briefs, to know what's going on around the states and what's working and what's not, and to talk to policymakers, to educate them and guide them, et cetera. And, and not to say that the educator can't do any of those things. I think they should do many of those things, all of those things, but it is not, we shouldn't place the burden on them. They already have full-time jobs. Um, so, so I think we need to, again, think about how do we, so it's, the, the question in my mind is, again, from a policy pr perspective is, how do I as a policy professional partner meaningfully, authentically, and on, in an ongoing way with educators? Um, and I think that takes a bit of a different muscle than what those of us who went through policy school, for example, who are even on the job, exercise. We don't use that muscle very often. Um, and so um, hopefully there are some people like me out there in the audience and policymakers and advocates who are listening to this. Because um, um, I think there are lessons that, that I have learned, um, particularly, so about six months ago, our organization organized a, a conference that some of you were at, actually both of these uh, educators were at this conference in Milwaukee, where we, it's a conference about the early education professional and we, we intentionally invited um, a, num, you know, a, a significant amount, a, a proportion of early child educators into the conference. And there are four things that I would say we need to do differently. One is the outreach. I mean, this, these are not, not like you know, sort of groundbreaking things, but there are things that we don't really do. So we need to do better at outreach um, in terms of when we have events, when we have these panels, when we are talking about policy solutions, reach out to uh, educators and find them where they are, not just like say, hey, well, here's an event, come. But we actually reached out to association and the NAYC, the Council for Professional Recognition, the Teach Network, and find them where they are. And that requires relationships. So, you, so we need to be, people like me and organizations that like the ones I work with, need to be developing relationship with those professional associations right now so that when you want to engage them, you already have those networks. The other is importance of critical mass. Um, and I'm not sure if we lived that in this event today, but, but at the event that, that I was talking about, we, had, we were shooting for a third of the audience being participants, um, being early child educators. And we got about maybe 25% to 30%, which, and that really changed the conversation and really brought, it enriched the conversation. Um, so the, 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 the proportion is important. And then getting them into the room, we learned a lot of lessons about, frankly, the money, the funding that was required to not only provide travel, but to, and then we were like, oh, wait, some of them are not gonna 
get any wages because they come to this conference for two or three days. Some of them are going to need subs and, um, and some of them are going to need translation. So all those things cost money and, and, and of course, and for, for thought. And so I think that's an important lesson for us. And then finally, one thing to get them in the room and the other thing to make them sort of help them um, uh, contribute in a, in a really um, full, in the fullest way possible. And so, and again, we didn't do this perfectly, but, but we, we could have done more prepping, uh, I think, um, to sort of help people understand what the meeting is about and what the policy conversations are gonna be, maybe provide some background knowledge and, 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 um, and talk about some of those prior dynamics and, and inform the, uh, the rest of the participants to sort of think about like when you speak, when, the poly, you know, when you're, if you're an advocate and you're speaking, maybe wait until somebody else has the, you know, has the room to like raise their hand so we can hear from the practitioner first. And so all those like lessons are things that we learned and I learned and I hope that policy professionals in the audience can, can take something from that. And, and also funders because um, again, some, uh, some of this require funding that uh, foundations may not usually fund and also it takes time to, to, to um, work on these things, so. Does anyone else want to add anything about how to authentically engage practitioners in these conversations? Well, I mean, our New America is in a similar um, position as being a, na a national organization like the the Alliance for Early Success. I'll say, although I would say, like we're not even as connected to states in the same way and, and advocacy groups in the same way. But I think that the point that um, Albert raises around like building partnerships with other organizations that um, are regularly, um, you know, interacting and um, um, and and talking to uh, pro professionals is is an important approach. And I think something you know we we go out and and visit a lot of um, you know s schools when we're writing about. Um, you know, different different communities or talk to, um, you know, when we're writing reports on states, you know, help us to identify like people that we can um, talk to and, and, and understand like how different policies are actually playing out for, for educators on the ground. And so I think that that's a really important point. I think I just wanted, the, the main reason I hit, hit my green was to, to just um, elevate a point that um, Ariel made, which, which kind of which stuck with me was around this like idea of serving surveying you know how many times do we uh or do states um survey educators and um you know not then include their perspective so i think this um notion of like meaningful and authentic and not just um you know asking their opinion on something and not doing anything ab about it i think the challenge for me is thinking about like how to include educator perspective and voices and experiences along the way um, to policy development or through implementation like how to how to to value that and and bring it in um, and, and include them in a meaningful way at different points um, so I, I you don't have to jump in but i'd love to just hear like thoughts from from um you all about like how to to do that like what makes sense to you so in your mind so one of the things that I, I remember about the conference that Albert was mentioning is at the end, uh, having this feeling that we have discussed several things, we have present our opinion, we have present our reality, and then what? You know, you, you have this idea that you've been validated by peers, by, by policymakers, by politicians, and then you go home. So, what was the point that how do you involve the, the educators and the practitioners along all the way? I mean, there were wonderful ideas that were discussed at that conference. And my point was like, why don't we create a committee and we try something of this out? Why we don't create a pilot program? You know, you guys are working in higher ed, you're doing professional development. We, we can all get connected and let's give us a year. Let's try a couple of things out and we report next year and we say, oh, this is working, this is not working. Uh, sometimes I feel like policy get imposed and, and when it look like a great idea in theory, it doesn't work many times in the practice. Um, a beautiful example is inclusion. You know, we, we can talk a lot of, about inclusion and special education, but when it was launched for the first time, 
uh, inclusion is not just about to have a variety of children in the same classroom. It requires, you know, implementation and wraparound services and professional development, and it's great and it will work and everybody will benefit if everything is in place. But you just say, oh, this child will be included and you put it in that classroom with that teacher, it doesn't guarantee success. So, uh, yes, it harms. So all this discussion and all these wonderful ideas, my whole point is why we don't try it out? You know, why we don't create these committees and we do piloting programs and we keep working. And so the practitioners and the administrators and the policymaker are working collaborative along the way in all the steps. And then we can really see how we can perfect something or how we can add it in a way that at, at the level that we're going to implement it, it will work or what kind of adaptation it will need depending on the population that you're working with. Well, um, I really believe that education has been traditionally very vertical. Mm -hmm. Things come from the top down and we obey. <laughs> And if we want to get this right, we need to change that culture and we need to make it more horizontal. I have learned that in improving the quality of the work that we do in our organization. I've learned that every time that something was not going right, I had to not just come up with my best answer. I needed to go down to the floor and see what was happening and listen to the teachers and see what was going on with the children and hear my patterns because sometimes I come with very smart ways of addressing a little problem. Okay, I noticed that there's more accidents taking place from 9 to 9.30. Okay, we're only gonna serve breakfast until 8.30. Great solution, right? Because that's the time when it really quite doesn't work like that. Only when I hear the feedback of the people that I work do I start to realize that the mistakes that I make from overlooking or overseeing or simplifying, oversimplifying the solutions to a problem, whatever, however big or small that pro pro problem might be. I, I really agree with everybody here in the fact that I believe early childhood is a very complex vocational and relational field. It requires building relationships for us to get it right. And we need to engage with people that are in the front line building those relationships in the first place. We talk about advancement in education and obtaining degrees. I'm, wear, I'm gonna wear my employer hat and I'm gonna tell you that I have hired people that have master's degrees in early childhood. I've put them with a good salary because they had their title under their arm in a classroom with two-year-olds and they have lasted there for two weeks in a very traumatic experience to them and to everybody else. I really think that in order to be successful in what we want to accomplish, we need to truly shift the paradigm of education and understand early childhood as it is and embrace it as it is. We cannot just have teachers going to college to obtain a degree. We need to colleges to understand what early childhood is all about and to put together a cohesive, effective platform so that educators can advance in their education and improve the skills. I, I really believe that a lot of the principles that we use in early childhood also should be applied to early childhood. And I'm gonna name one, developmentally appropriate practice. We talk about meeting children where they are. If we wanna be successful at this, we also need to meet teachers where they are. Now, the question is, do we know where they are? Do we know who they are? Do we know what they have, what they don't have and what they really need? It's almost like going back to the Maslow hierarchy of needs, you know? We're demanding teachers to be up there, but we're not giving them the baseline to be able to meet their basic needs. I mean, scientifically, it's been demonstrated that if you wanna achieve 
and get them to be there, then all of the base needs to be covered. And currently that's not covered. Are we ready to cover that? Do we have the funding available to make that happen? I was once hired to bring NAEYC accreditation to a program that was uh, here, not far from here. I'm not going to say where, but anyway. Um, and the moment that my board of directors realized, I mean, everybody wanted to have an AEYC accreditation in that program, but they were not really willing to make the investment that was required to get there. And, and I am a very stubborn person. So I said, well, we're gonna have an AEYC because I said that I was being hired to do this and I'm gonna do this anyway. And I made it happen. And the next day I, I received a letter of NAEYC saying your program is accredited. I also submitted my resignation and moved on because that's how I felt. I, I, I felt burned up by having to meet a, a goal without having the supports in place to make that happen. Now, we have to be very careful because we need early childhood. We need this workforce. We cannot put more weight to their shoulders without giving the support they need. Talking about inclusion and talking about policies. The block grant states that every child that has a diagnosed disability should have double rate coming from the subsidy. Right now in my program in Virginia, we have 40% of the children in our program who have either an IEP or an IFSP. Don't ask me why I have such a high number because it's probably because we're one of the few programs that still welcome these children to, through the door and we're willing to, and I have amazing, incredible, fascinating early childhood providers that are just as stubborn as I am when it comes to meeting the needs of children in our community. But we only get the reimbursement as of yesterday for two of those children, as of today for four of those children. So policies can be in place, but how are we gonna ensure that those policies are trickling down and are being effective exactly. and the funding is going where it's needed? We need you there. And how are you gonna know that if we don't have the conversation, if we don't have this parallel um, relationship being built? That I don't know. So that's where I think this whole nut is. What do we really want to do? And what resources do we really need to have in place to make that happen? So kind of building on that, um, you talk about the base, what's needed at the base level to support educators, and then we kind of go above the base. So can we actually talk about what are those base levels of supports and what do we need on top of that to truly make an impact um, in the ways that have been discussed today? So I think, like I think before, when we talk about degrees and we talk about certifications, we need to support every step of the ladder. 120 hours of coursework is not enough in order to be working with children, and that's what is required for a CDA. Uh, uh, we provide CDA. One of the things that we did in 2014 was bump it up 30 hours. So our CDA is 150 hours, even though the council only require 120. Why? Because any educator right now who work in an urban setting is going to be facing dual language, uh, bilingualism, uh, special needs, and so many other things that they need to be prepared for. So if what you have is a CDA and Valora Washington is really wanted to do this bad just things for CDA, and she has this idea that we keep talking and I really hope it does, um, you need this kind of expertise. So support the ladder at every level because the field change. I mean, we are assessing all our pre-K students with class, all our classroom with class. A test that is great, they talk about interaction, but it's based in brain research. What do we know our educators know how to scaffold brain research and bring it into the classroom? You know, connecting theory with practice is one of the biggest problems that we have at any kind of level right now. Uh, and that's, that's one of the biggest issues. I think we did a lot of interview with many centers 
And I was asking simple questions and I say, what did you do sell for time? And everybody was talking to me about, well, because we need to, you know, make the child feel welcome and we're all friends and we're going to start a new day. And, and then I say, okay, forget about the social emotional component because we've been doing that right for years. Now, if we think in language and cognition, what do we do circle time for? And nobody was able to answer me. You know, how circle time will benefit that? I mean, why do we have a block area? Why do we have a dramatic play area? Our educator needs this kind of technical language that all the other field has so they can feel proud of themselves and they don't say, oh, she's able to play peekaboo. She say, well, she understands conservation of contency and that's really important when she develops abstraction later. You know, that's the kind of connections that we need to make. So the field is changing. There's a lot of brain research now as a part of our field. That's what the whole uh, War is looking at early childhood as the solution for problems. However, I don't think our teaching training programs has taken that research and make it look like what does it look like in the classroom? How child development looked in the making with a child in front of your eyes? And how do you connect this theory to practice? How do we take this assessment and this report we receive is connected to instruction. So it's actually helped us to improve a practice. And it's not just a report that says a bunch of things that doesn't allow me to improve because I, right now I don't even have the name of the teacher or the classroom that was assessed. So it's completely useless. I receive all these kind of indicators that I cannot use to target a, you know, professional development. So I think a teaching training programs need to be strength at every step of the ladder. I think that there's a lot of content they need to be added in terms of brain research, special need, and dual language uh, and bilingualism. And I truly believe that programs like that we're talking before, that's what I say, I would like to see a comparative study. You know, they are doing this apprenticeship and they're doing this place program when the students are learning in, in the actual center and they're seeing it there and reporting there. Is that really make a difference? Because for my experience in 20 years in professional development, the problem is how I connect this, what I learn, and I take it into the classroom and how do I really put this into practice? So if we are making, if we want to have reflective practitioners, then we need to have programs that really aim for reflective practitioners that are structured in a way that teachers will reflect. And in the other hand, the counterpart of that is that you need administrators that are instructional leaders. I mean, it's wonderful to have universal pre-K, uh -huh. but if your principal or your school is a middle school teacher who doesn't understand anything about the early childhood, then it's not the right person to lead that path. So we, we do a lot of administrations, but uh, you need an instructional leader that will be able to uh, foster intentional planning in that center and really scaffold how this assessment, how these indicators of quality are translated into a real classroom. Well, um, I, I believe, I strongly believe in something that uh, Mr. Rogers said a long time ago, and I quoted him yesterday, and I'm going to quote him again today, uh, just because it's a safe thing to do in early childhood. <laughs> um, he said, look for the helpers in your communities, right? I think that I have been very, very lucky to learn to work in a place like ACA. And why is that? It's because I earlier mentioned this is a relational field. It's easy to try to find the one person that will come with the one solution. But if we're looking for that one solution in one place, then we're not going to be affected. Because the solutions need to come from different places, from different people, in different scenarios, in different places. I, I was invited to participate in Virginia in the task force work group to assess the needs of the state. And, and just in Virginia, not to mention the entire country, there's just so much diversity there. 
and what's my reality is not the reality of the program in, that operates in a house and it's not the reality of a program that is adjacent to a school. It, we have different realities, but we also have different opportunities and different resources. It's like almost we have to do a SWOT analysis to understand where we are and what each program needs. And, and of course that's not feasible, but what is feasible is to create models that would allow administrators, that will allow the communities to start building the infrastructure that is needed to improve the field across the board. What my teachers needed to embark in this adventure of obtaining a bachelor's degree was to advance in their English skills first, was to have a computer, was not to have to pay for the printing of their homework because they don't have the funds to do it. So in my program, if a teacher is studying and they use their break time to print their homework, nobody's gonna go to them and say, hey, why is it that you're printing 50 pages in color? Um, my teachers needed help with an increase of a salary so that they can pay for the transportation from and to the school. And then I realized I could also call NOVA and now we're doing classes in the program for them. So they don't have to go anywhere. They don't have to spend extra time. We provide childcare if it's needed. We need to meet them where they are and how that looks might differ from place to place. But who's there making those decisions and facilitating that path? Do we really wanna do it? I mean, I've also been losing my teachers as they have graduated because now I don't have the funding to pay their salaries and now they're going and working for the school system. Mm -hmm. And I give them a hug and I cry with them. They don't wanna leave. I don't want them to leave, but they're leaving because they have to maintain their families at home. And that's just the reality of it. So we talk about protecting mixed delivery. Yeah, how are we gonna do it if we don't get a good streamline of funding coming to us? Um, again, it's a complex issue, but it will only be resolved if we all have the drive to make this path and to bring it one step at a time. I really think that um, I have yet to meet one early childhood provider that doesn't want to advance in their career and in their profession. They're willing to sacrifice more than anybody else I've seen in my entire life. And I'm proud to be an early childhood provider because I see that happening in the places where I've worked time and time and time again. I've seen the effort of these immigrant people like me that come to this country and have to learn a second language in order to access information, in order to communicate with each other, in order, and, and you know, people say, you're crazy. How many hours you live in this place and say, well, what a, normally to a person would take them five hours of work, it takes eight hours of my work to do because I have to, you know, reshift and, and think and, and edit three times everything that I read or write so that I get it right. And recognizing this effort is important. It's equally important to recognize the value that, that all this diversity brings to the table and to understand that I don't need one educator to do the same that the other educator does. You know, the, the skill sets that are needed to successfully run a classroom demand different kind of people. And, and, and you cannot pretend that just one degree is going to solve everything or just one kind of person is going to be the early childhood educator. We need to understand that we early childhood educators are diverse within our diversity. No? And to get those groups right, those groups of teachers that are working in a classroom for not eight hours, not six hours, from for Two. eight to 11 hours yep. at a time. You know, we need to give them the supports that they need. They need a counselor yeah, available to them Monday through Friday because they have children that have needs and parents that have needs Monday through Friday. And we need to troubleshoot that so that they can have the mental health 
to have these wonderful meaning, move, meaningful interactions that we're measuring with class. By the way, I'm certified with infant solar first. Yeah, me too. Uh, and I'm a trainer for, uh, affiliate trainer for class as well. I believe in these tools. I believe in, in, in measurements. I believe in accountability, but everything begins with that relationship. And when I lose a teacher, I might hire somebody else that has a degree. It takes about six months for that teacher to start to begin to even think that they, that teacher is starting to perform at the level that the teacher who left is coming into. So, you know, I'm highly interested in seeing and I'm excited about seeing all the progress that our field is making in the last few years with the final acknowledgement that what happens in the first five years of life yes. in these children matters. We all have understood the importance of making it right at this time in, in age. We also know the impact in the economy when we do this job right. So why is it that we continue to put the burden in the shoulders of the people that are contributing the most to our nation? Isn't it about time that we just pay the bill? <laughs> and when I say I pay the bill, I'm not talking only about the government or the tax contributors. I'm talking about corporate America. I'm t talking about businesses. I'm talking, if you wanna get this right, you need to bring everybody to the table and everybody needs to take the responsibility that they have. And it's the only way we're gonna get this done. This can be a great opportunity for higher education systems to obtain more funding. All this talk about early childhood, how is that gonna translate to our educators? I am talking too much, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I get driven away. It's okay. Um, so Laura, going to your closing essay for the compendium, you write that a knot cannot be undone until you pay attention to all ends of its threads. Is it possible to examine all of the ends simultaneously? And if not, what do we prioritize doing first? Well, I think just from some of the conversation that, that we've heard both earlier, but just right now, um, we have to pay, to pay attention to all ends simultaneously. Um, but I don't think that means that we can pull on them all at the same time. Um, that'll just end up making things tighter. But we do have to give them attention and, and consideration. And so that means if we you know, start pulling on this uh, degrees and education side without also paying attention to the compensations and status side or diversity and inclusion side, then we're just not going to get anywhere. And so I think, um, but when we think about like where to focus first as we're looking at the full knot, um, this idea of a long-term vision I think is really important and an understanding of like, where do we really want to end up? Where does the field really want to end up? Um, and that means looking beyond like what's in place today and what's achievable today, but really where is that end that we want to be? And so um, as we think about that long-term vision and I, it's not, I can be part of helping to set it, but it's not my job and nor should it be to like say what that vision should be. But I think we have to question as that's being developed, like what actions might be being taken now that are actually um, potentially leading to stalled progress or taking the field further away from what that ideal could be. And so after the Transforming the Workforce report came, came out, you know, all of this flurry of work back in 2015, now all the flurry of work started happening at the state level, at the national level, even at the local level. Um, and, but, I, I, I raise that point because there's another report that came out. It's this transforming the financing report that came out in 2017. Um, and give ourselves a plug, we're releasing a, a, a guidebook to, to help people kind of think through how to use that better, which will come out at the end of this month. But 
I haven't seen the same kind of activity around the transforming the financing report that we did around the workforce. Um, not, not the same flurry and excitement. Um, but that I would say that the financing is, the funding is really an important piece. There's not enough money in the system. There's not enough federal investment. If we look at just the, um, you know, the, the spending just at the federal level um, in relationship to GDP, like early childhood investment is just this little tiny, like barely, barely a, a mark on, on the pie chart. Um, and state and local investment isn't, um, you know, where it needs to be either. And high quality early childhood education um, and meaning a diverse, well-prepared, well compensated workforce, when we say high quality early childhood education, um, it needs to be rec recognized and valued in the same way. Um, and I would say even more so than the other areas of spending that, that we're making. Um, and so I think that vision and the financing behind it have to be, um, you know, close first and second, you know, pieces to focus on. And then the third is this uh, higher ed and um, preparation. And I think there's a lot of work that needs to be there, be done there. There's a lot of um, innovation to, to think about, delivery. We heard a lot of conversation to reflect again, like earlier um, on, um, you know, some innovations in higher ed that could be taking place. Questions for me is like, how do we make sure that that those kinds of things happen in more than just the University of Colorado and Denver or the University of Nebraska. Like what can we learn from those places that can be transferable to other institutions of higher ed at the four year level and at the two year level and, and become stackable with these other, uh, you know, CDA, but other ideas of micro credentials and things that are being talked about in the field. Um, and just to tease again, like some things we're doing, we're, we're looking at um, our you New know, America Early and Elementary Ed team, um, some different kinds of innovations across the country and hope to have a, and we'll have a brief out later um, that looks at the barriers that institutions face to better serving and preparing and supporting early childhood educators and, the, you know, which is really the larger non-traditional workforce that, that, that they, you know, are, are um, you know, share a lot of similarities. Um, and so what, what, what are those barriers? What are institution? What are the institutions that are doing some things differently? And then, what are the levers at the institutional level, state level, community level, federal level that can make that happen in more places? So, I think we do have some questions from the audience. So, um, but before that, if we could just anyone in the room has any question that they would like to ask of this panel, please go ahead and raise your hand. Yes. Sir? I'm Robert Deporek. I came from Philadelphia and I have no degrees. <laughs> and, um, well, not real degrees like from higher institutions, but I have many degrees of experience and accomplishments, et cetera, et cetera. And my real job in life is I do something called Rothing. Anybody ever heard of Rothing? Good. And I study directly with Dr. Roth and I'm pioneering Rothing babies and children, which makes a significant difference in their neurological development. Has anybody heard of the Institute for the Achievement of Human Potential in Philadelphia? They have a one week course called How to Give Your Baby Encyclopedic Knowledge. And I took that a long time ago. And I like to say it this way, I'm not the nicest person, the most suave person, but I'm the only person that's been able to get that program in a public school in Philadelphia for three years. And so I really appreciate being here. I appreciate the work you're doing, the heart you have, the, and I'm glad to see that I'm not the only person struggling <laughs> to make a difference with what's actually happening on the street. And uh, over the last 23 years, without any significant funding or staff, I've managed to distribute close to 18,000 low-cost refurbished computers to people that can't afford to buy new ones. And so I have direct access to people who are at, the, are at the lowest level of life and I'm struggling to find ways to reach them. And this conversation has to reach them in a way that's not reaching them now. And one of my questions is, have you ever thought of using technology conferences, a national program of early childhood education, a channel called National Early Child Education Channel where parents could tune in 
and begin to be engaged in this conversation. Anybody thought about that one? <laughs> well, and then there's, you know, I'm not sure if it's, it's totally focused on, on the topic, but I would just, you know, there is definitely a, a number of uh, pro technology sort of uh, projects, actually Lisa, you should talk about this. <laughs> you know, projects in early child education that leverages the power of the technology to support families and parents to be better support their kids at home and in the community. There's also a variety of online strategies that pre pre help prepare early child educators to become more competent um, in their work. So I, there, there is quite a bit of work in this area, I would, I would think, but not maybe at the systems level, but definitely, you know, in terms of other sectors. So taking a question from um, the online audience, do you have any ideas of how to push policymakers to give the supports on a systemic level? One of the things that I learned about uh, these um, was in Milwaukee, when we were listening from one of the legislators and he gave us advice, and the advice of going with a unified voice with clear specific objectives to be achieved because this is such a complex issue that when we start talking to legislators about the issues and the challenges that we face they go like forget about it it's too much i'm not going to do anything done I i'm not going to get anything done so coming up with a to-do list of what our priorities are, unifying the voice around those priorities and being very uh, strategic about what is presented and what voices we bring to the table. I think it's, it's crucial. So I'll, I'll just add to that. Um, I think we, the field, um, uh, we need to do a better job at communicating um, the problem that we're talking about. I don't, because people are not going to address or find solutions and invest in things that they don't feel like it's a problem. I don't know. So we, there's been a lot more recognition about the importance of the first five years in our society and among, even among policymakers. But I don't know that that has translated to then the importance of providing rigorous professional preparation and supports to the early childhood education profession. Um, because I think that a lot of people still think that, you know, if you can play peekaboo yeah. and you can baby build blocks and you can teach them letters, you can do this job. And it's not about the, the fact that peekaboo actually gets you to subtraction, <laughs> which is great. Um, you know, so, so the policymakers have to understand why the investment is necessary. Why, why is it not okay that, you know, the educators are getting paid 10 to $12 an hour um, and and uh, and then we're losing them to you know Target and other industry. And then when they get the VA, they get to you know go to the public school. So so I think the communication, the making the case, I think we're still not quite there as far as the early charge of edu education profession is concerned. I agree with with Marie Isabel in the sense of we have to find some consensus in certain things that we've been discussing for years and we still not agree on it such as school readiness that we all interpreted differently. And is that the ending line for us that the child need to be ready for school and we don't have the same vision of what it means to be ready, then we have a problem because we, we don't have a clear outcome that we're aiming for. So definitely unify voice and more consensus in these terms that we are advocating for. And, and I think, uh, it's important if the teachers in this case and the practitioners need to have this technical language. I think it's important when I talk to my CDA students, I say, you are the people who's going to wire the brain of a child. Can you think in something more important than that? And then I push them and I push them every time to use some technical language because I, I wanted to empower them that when those talk to the parents or talk to anybody else, they're able to articulate this in a way that people will listen to them. You know, if we keep 
articulating this in a sense, oh yes, we play with this and that, but we don't make those connections that go farther and say, you know, doing all of this it has this impact later on in life and it's gonna cost you this much. And we're talking about, you know, how you're gonna avoid high school dropout and lowering their incarceration rate and so many other things. We have to be able to articulate that properly. So policymakers understand, you know, what is the voice, what is the message, and what are you asking for? So here's another question from the online audience. What is the balance between hearing and amplifying the voices for ECE practitioners and putting the burden of advocacy and changing institutionalized structures on them? Well, I don't know of any early childhood provider that is omnipresent. Yet, we have to invest in ourselves. And engaging in advocacy is investment, I believe. For as much as it is not easy to be at the table when conversations are taking place, we need to realize as a field that if we're not at the table, we will have to live with what is at the table. And if that's not us, then who? I believe that there are helpers in the world that can facilitate that process. You guys have been an instrumental support for the voices in our field and I encourage you to continue to do so. Um, the work that you all are doing is extremely important, but you cannot do it without us. And I was very saddened yesterday and ex excited. It was a happy day for me, but it was a happy day when we are celebrating the power of the profession. And there were only two early childhood providers that I could identify as providers in the, in the audience. I know that from their houses, from their workplaces, they, they were joining the conversation but they were not there. So making the investment to be there is, is important. And, and we leaders, I mean, directors, administrators, we need to recognize that as a strategy for advancement in our profession and, and give it the power that it requires. Um, so I'm not a historian, but it, it seems to me that in our history, we've had, um, many struggles and, and fought a lot of fights um, where people without power and people who are you know, poor and, and you know, what, whatever circumstance they're in have joined in a movement to make progress for themselves and for the, for the country in general. And so while I used the word burden earlier, while it is a burden to, for us to expect that early child educators who are paid $10 an hour also go to the state capitol and like talk to the elected officials and all that. It does happen when they are given support and when there is organizing yeah. involved, right? So there are organizations, not so much the policy organizations, but there are community organizations whose, whose work is to spend every day, every minute in the community talking to educators, parents, families, and helping them in part, and I, I've heard that people should not use the word empower because that assumes that they don't have any power, but I don't remember what the alternative phrase is. But you get my point that, um, uh, and to, to, to work with them as leaders in advocacy. And so I think in our organization, the Alliance for Early Success, we've been thinking a lot about how do we as an organization and also the organization we work with around the country and states that are by and large, you know, grass tops organization, how do we partner with community organizers so that we don't, we're not, we're not going to be the ones who have the relationships to like sort of engage with educators and parents directly, perhaps, but that there are intermediate organizations that we can work with, so that there is, so that, so that when we are doing our policy work, that we can work alongside other organizations who have those relationships, who 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 can connect us with the grassroots and work in more partnership on some of our policy and advocacy work. 
I think there's also a little bit of a onus on organizations like New America and who are, are you know, out um, writing on policies that we might say are, are good practices at the state level or even at the local level of asking questions about like, well, how educators, you know, perspectives were included or how it's working. How is this actually going to work? What kinds of professional developments or other things are being put into place with this other requirement, like asking questions about how perspectives and educator voice is being included um, in these new policy proposals that are put forward. Um, so that, that's a role that I think is important for organizations like ours. So I think we have time for one last question. And this one is also from the online audience. How realistic is it to continue asking ECE practitioners to engage in continuous and ongoing professional growth, including reflective practice, when they aren't currently receiving the support needed in terms of finances and material supports to sustain their own well-being. It's not realistic. It's that very simple answer. I mean, we all suffer of, we invest so much in our teachers. We, we have a fellowship program. We take people, we help them to complete the CDA. We provide coaching. We do all these kind of things. They're now in a school and I'm pretty sure that most of them, when they receive their degree, if I'm not able to raise their salary, they're going to go to a place that the salary is raised. So you are working in this situation like, okay, let me keep you for two years and then you know that you're going to have to exchange and you will have a totally new cohort of people coming, which is tremendously costly, uh, not just financially, but in terms of time and energy, you know, to prepare them to get there, and then you ended up losing it. So uh, uh, if we don't, if we don't um, improve the compensation issue, I think this is not realistic. You know, we have here uh, these requirements in DC that people by the end of the year all need to have a CDA. It doesn't look like too much, you know, but with so many people to spend two evenings of their week, uh, you know, after 6 p.m., go to study from six to nine and complete this whole process. It's a lot that how that much make when that is finished, 50 cents an hour, 25 cents an hour. Uh, can you offer them three more dollars an hour for that? No, that's a reality. So I have this wonderful fellowship program is, oh, they finish and they come so proudly show me their certificate. And I have a terrible be a shame that I have to say, well, I can raise your salary 50 cents. And then I do my math and I see, okay, after I take taxes and all of this, what did that really means to you? You know, how I acknowledging, you know, one in the financial, but in the other way, it's like a, how much I value this, what kind of value are giving that, that you are a wonderful professional that wiring that child brain and I'm paying you for that 50 more cents an hour. You know, that's the kind of judgment that was. So it's not sustainable. I mean, you want to spend all of this and this, and then they will leave to the school system or to public schools or whoever can pay them more. I could not echo that more. <laughs> and there is just one thing that I will add. It amazes me that are people that are thinking human beings, making an informed decisions, and the investment of going to school to obtain a degree in early childhood when they know that doesn't mean anything. Why they don't go into nursing? Why they don't go into other fields? For heaven's sake, early childhood doesn't give you the money. So we are kind of masochists here. <laughs> I mean, we, we know, and, we, and let me tell you why we do it. We do it because we love the children. We do it because we believe in what we do, because there is a higher purpose, higher than finances, higher than personal gain, higher than, than comfort levels that we may achieve higher than our own family members. Mm -hmm. That's what I said, it's a vocational field. It's, it's not only a complex, it's a relational, but it's, 
a vocational field because only people that I know that have the vocation to be where they are, are doing what they're doing. And I'm impressed. I mean, I, I talk to my teachers that are going and, and they're studying and, and I dared to ask them the other day, hey, knowing that I know everything, I said, show me what you're studying. And they come with a, a notebook with biology. It, it was a biology class. And I'm thinking, okay, biology. I understand biology is important if you want to work with human beings, right? But what level of biology? I mean, how meaningful that particular class of biology it is for them to go back to the classroom. A lot of them are taking classes on things that are totally unrelated. And somebody came to me, somebody in the higher educational field and said, well, it's, you know, Isabel, uh, there is general culture. We need to know there's things that we need to learn just because we have to learn them. And I'm thinking, wait, let me get my, my uh, hi, Alexa. You know, we need to realize that we live in the world of Alexas and we live in a world where Siri. information is there if we need it. But what we need is to develop the competencies that we need to have in place to do our job right. So one thing that can be very, very, and to the folks that were talking in the first panel, that could be very, very important is to make learning meaningful mm -hmm. for early childhood educators. Don't feel a class of coursework just because you think it's important. Do it in response to the need that we have if we wanna be successful because otherwise, what we're doing is pushing people away. I mean, all the teachers that I know have been dragging that class to the end because it's not that they don't like learning, it's because they're interested in learning things that are that matter to them. I'm sorry, but I'm very honest. Albert, you wanna you wanna yeah, close so, this out? Okay, so so to answer that question again, I, I agree, not realistic. Um, and it, you know, one of the first things that there, I don't think there's a one next step. I think it's to Laura's point earlier. Thank I think you. we need to address these things collectively. We have no, if we learn nothing from you know from the past few years is that we can't just work on degrees or compensation or diversity without, without paying attention to all those strands. But one of the first things I would do is about compensate. We need to find the public will and the public um, revenue or reallocation of some of our existing dollars to dedicate a compensation. I would just also put out there that right now, today, without doing anything about where, you know, what kind of degrees and credentials early child educators have, we need to lift the floor. It is, again, not okay no. that early child educators get paid $10 an hour. No. And that's half of it. That's median. So, so the half of them are below that. Um, and so we need to raise the floor to, to a living wage and however you define that standard. And there are plenty of places that have helped you define that standard. And we also need to raise the roof. And, um, and I've seen, what I've appreciated in the, in the last few last year or so is that a number of places, um, I can think of like Rhode Island has done this, Washington State, North Carolina has also done this, DC is doing it, is they've kind of been working on a salary scale of, for early child educators. And while just be, by having a scale doesn't mean you get the money to pay people at that scale, it is a stake in the ground about what early child educators need to have in terms of compensation at different levels of competency and degree and experience. Mm -hmm. And I think by putting that stake out, then we know, okay, then we need so many, so much more money into the system so that we can compensate early child educators more uh, um, uh, adequately. So. Um, so just one thing to add on, um, it, part of what, what you said is, is why I bring up I brought up the larger financing piece, but one thing that I would say in relationship to to compensation is that there are a lot of good, there are some initiatives to um, address the salary scale. I would say that there are also some initiatives around 
pay that I think m move us farther away from increasing overall compensation around like well-meaning initiatives like tax credits and wage um, subsidies that um, are helpful in the moment but not helpful for the long-term compensation increases and so I think we should do more of the kinds of things that Albert mentioned some states are doing and less of the, some of these other ideas being tried. So that's all the time we have for today. Um, thanks everyone for joining. The report is online and the financing report that Laura alluded to will be out later this month.